Pursuant to Section 84-1411 of the Nebraska Statutes, notice of this meeting was given on December 1, 2017. The meeting will convene at approximately 6.30 p.m., and visitors may obtain a request to be heard form from staff for any presentation they may have for the meeting. In accordance with policy, the request to be heard form must be submitted to the secretary within the first five minutes of the board meeting in order to be heard at this meeting. Agenda items are subject to reordering at the discretion of the board president, so please attend the entire meeting to ensure you're able to hear any discussion. I don't think there's a B. I think it's B per. Yeah. Is there a B right there? Uh, instead of the M, there's a B. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think. Maybe I think MB. Yeah, I think it is actually. Yeah. I hate getting new phones. I, I it's never like do. Shifts your entire world, doesn't it? So yeah, it's it took me two months to get that. I could have swore it was because I put it in here recently. Alright, cool. Thanks. Does he have a really good time with Ron? Oh, hey. Nice. How are you? She had a really good time. How are you? Good. She said hey. it was she really fun. She loved the pizza. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because her head, apparently. Yeah, she was. I had never met her before. I never had her. You guys had a good time, huh?
fun night. You guys yeah. doing any public comment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to. Pursuant to Section 84-1411 of the Nebraska Statutes, the next meeting of the Board of Education of Douglas County School District 0001 will be held on Monday, December 18, 2017 at 6.30 p.m. in the board meeting room of the Teacher Administrative Center, 3215 Cumming Street. The agenda will be kept current and available for public inspection in the Office of the Secretary of the Board of Education at the Administrative Building during regular working hours. Pursuant to Section 84-1412 of the Nebraska Statutes, the public is hereby informed that a current copy of the Nebraska Open Meetings Act is posted in the board meeting room on the north wall. Please stand and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. Vice President Snow will now lead us in the OPS vision and mission statement. And I'll start with the vision. Every student, every, every day, prepared for success in the mission. Omaha Public Schools prepares all students to excel in college, career, and life. Roll call, please, Mr. Ray. Cassidy. Godding. Hallman. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were Did here. you want me to answer for no. everybody? Or yes. just <laughs> Godding is here. Thank you. America? Present. Perlman? Here. Ryan? Here. Scanlon? Snow? Here. Williams? Present. Six present. Um, Dr. Holman and Ms. Cassidy let us know that they would not be able to make it tonight, um, and Mr. Scanlon is running a little behind, um, so I would entertain a motion to excuse their absences. So move. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Snow and a second by Mrs. Godding. Roll call, please, Mr. Ray. Godding? Aye. America? Aye. Perlman? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Snow? Aye. Williams? Aye. Six aye. Motion passes. Uh, we will move on to our OPS Proud Spotlight um, and Mrs. Monique Farmer. Good evening, Madam President, members of the board, and Superintendent Evans. Our OPS Proud Spotlight tonight is on Dundee Elementary's school, um, school's principal Kay Kennedy, assistant principal Jean Simmons, teachers and students. Um, principal Kennedy does send her regrets this evening as she was unable to make it. In September, Dundee Elementary was designated an exemplary high-performing school for 2017 by the U.S. Department of Education. Dundee Elementary is one of four schools named a National Blue Ribbon School, and it is among 342 schools nationwide to be recognized for demonstrating exemplary academic performance or progress in closing the achievement gap. The school was honored at an award settlement award ceremony in Washington, D.C. this past November. We salute the students, the staff, and the teachers of Dundee Elementary for this great achievement. This is the second time that the school has received this honor. They were also awarded the Blue Ribbon in 2005. I would now like to welcome Assistant Principal Jean Simmons to the podium. Thank you. Good evening, Superintendent Evans, members of the school board and community members. My name is Jean Simmons and I am the proud assistant principal of Dundee Elementary School. Sadly, our principal, Kay Kennedy, is ill, so I will be speaking on her behalf. Ms. Kay Kennedy and I have just returned from Washington, D.C., where we accepted the 2017 National Blue Ribbon Award from the Department of Education. I know that I speak for both of us when I say that we were so proud and fortunate to be accepting this award on behalf of Dundee and the Omaha Public Schools. During discussions with other school leaders at the event, we became more aware and even more appreciative of our fine students, staff, and parents of Dundee. 
We view this award as really a school and community award because we all work together. Many have asked, what is your secret at Dundee? One secret is our principal, Kay Kennedy. She is a true leader who, will, who practices with integrity each and every day. We believe that it all begins with creating an intentionally inviting environment where all people know they are valued. The entire Dundee staff and community work hard to make sure that every child knows that they are important and they will, we will do whatever it takes to help them achieve and reach their highest potential. Tonight we will have three representatives who will be sharing their viewpoints on how and why Dundee has earned this wonderful honor. Nate Dickerson, a parent of three children who all attend Dundee. He is the treasurer to our PTO and has been for the past three years. Mary Ann Colasacco, our wonderful school counselor who goes above and beyond her job title to help our students, parents, and staff members every day. And we will end with one of our finest sixth grade students, Hime Moore, a student who has attended Dundee since kindergarten and just did a beautiful job singing in a trio at our school musical. Thank you very much for allowing us the time to share just a few snapshots of Dundee. We appreciate your support. Mr. Nate Dickerson. I'm a parent, PTO member, and part of the broader Dundee community. Uh, it's been a blessing for my three children to attend this wonderful and diverse school. I know when I send them off to school each day that they're going to learn and grow in the right kind of environment. The combination of uh, dedicated and talented teachers committed and caring administrators and staff and strong support from parents and the community leads to success for our students. I've been told that we live in the Dundee bubble like it's a fantasy and something less realistic than other schools or other districts. Don't get me wrong, we are very fortunate, but I know that Dundee Elementary is a real school with real challenges and real problems just like many other urban schools. It takes hard work, smart planning, empathy, time, talent, and resources from a whole host of people to address those challenges and keep every student learning and growing every day. Instead of a Dundee bubble, I think what we really have here is Dundee minds, Dundee heart, and a Dundee way. Congratulations to the outstanding students and staff and teachers and administrators of Dundee Elementary on achieving Blue Ribbon School status. The whole community is very proud of you. Hello, my name is Marianne Colasacco and I've been Dundee's counselor for 20 years now. At a staff meeting, I asked for suggestions about what to say tonight, so this is kind of what we all came up with. I'm going to start big with the entire Dundee community, which is so wonderfully unique, and our PTO, two really, really special entities who support us unconditionally. And then there are the administrators, Kay Kennedy and Jean Simmons, and you will not find two better bosses or people. They have our backs and they guide and lead us in a fun, genuine, and really thoughtful manner. And then you have us, the staff, <laughs> the staff over there. We support one another, we collaborate, we stay positive, and we make a sincere effort to do the right things for all of our students. And then the best of all is that you have our students. A few weeks ago, they were asked to write why Dundee is a blue ribbon school. And here are just a few of their responses. Dundee is a blue ribbon school because we have great lunches. <laughs> we work hard and we follow the golden rule. Everybody holds the door for everyone else. It's full of kind people. We work hard and the teachers do too. We have blue ribbon students. We have such good snacks. And my favorite, Dundee is a blue ribbon school because it is loving. At Dundee, Acting in a blue ribbon way is a culture, it's a climate, it's a community. And we are all so very, very proud to be part of it. Thank you. Good evening. 
I'm Hime Moore, and I'm a sixth grader at Dundee. I've been at Dundee my whole life. I can honestly say I love Dundee. Everybody cares for each other, and it doesn't matter if you're having a bad day. You can count on someone to cheer you up. I've learned not to give up when things get hard. There is so much support from friends and staff members. They won't let you give up. I have never felt different or left out at Dundee. Everyone is so kind and accepting of each other, and that is one of the reasons why I love going to school every day. Do I think these are reasons why we won the National Ribbon Award? Absolutely. Oh yeah, we do, our, we do a little work too. <laughs> <laughs> our teachers push us to do our best. They think of fun things to help us. They learn, sometimes it's so fun we forget we are learning. Thanks to you, our school board, for making decisions that positively affect us. And I'm proud to say I'm an OPS Dundee student. Okay. Um, board members, do we have any questions or comments before they all run to their chairs really, really quickly like everyone does? Mrs. Godding. Well, I just want to say congratulations. It's evident in listening to all three of you who spoke, and I'm sure the rest of you could have said many things too, that Dundee is a very special place. And so congratulations on your award. Thank you. Mr. Perlman. Thank you. I also want to congratulate uh, Dundee School, its leaders and its teachers. I, uh, as most of the board here knows, I was fortunate to go to Dundee a long time ago. I absolutely loved it. And uh, now my children go there. And uh, I could not be more grateful for uh, the education that they receive every day and all the hard work that, that everyone puts in every day. And i um, just so proud of everything that's going on there. So thanks. Yes, I also want to say congratulations. I think it's wonderful when we see our schools recognized, not just here at our board meetings, but on a national level as well, um, for the work that we know is, is happening in our buildings every day. Um, and I think we would like our students that are here from Dundee, as well as our assistant principal, to come around so we can congratulate you. And we actually have an OPS pin proud, um, OPS proud pin for you uh, when you walk across the Okay, and for our Dundee staff and family members who are there, we're going to come over there and do a picture with everyone so you're not all trying to fit around up here.
crossed the line. And, and as they're leaving, I, I do want to share a fact that was just shared with me. I just found out that one of the current staff members at Dundee was a student the last time they won a Blue Ribbon Award, um, which I think sh kind of highlights the, the strength and community that Dundee has built there. So, Awesome. <laughs> Just a, another fun fact, I know that Dr. Sturgeon, one of our executive directors, used to be the assistant principal there too, so I don't know if we can give him some credit for the success they're having there as well. But congratulations again, Dundee parents, Dundee students, Dundee staff, for a phenomenal, phenomenal success. All right, we'll move on to item G, which is Board and Superintendent Communications. And first up is Mr. Evans. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I'd, I'd like to start with uh, something that's been a difficult challenge for our school district this last week uh, and just recognize that unfortunately we lost two staff members, Mr. Tom Dickey, uh, most currently at, uh, recently at South High, but longtime North High teacher, and Miss Michelle Ricard, who is also uh, was a North High teacher. Unfortunately, we lost them both last week. I was at the service for Mr. Dickey on Saturday, and um, the staff at North and the staff at South, I just want to give our thoughts and prayers for all of them. Uh, those are some fine, fine, not only teachers, but people. Um, I knew Mr. Dickey personally and have known him for five years, and, and he's somebody who cared not only about kids at South High, but kids at North High as well. And if you'd have been there on Saturday, you'd have heard some of the, the kind words about who he was as a person, and I know Mr. Ricard is just the same. So please keep the North High, South High family, as well as both of the teachers' families in your thoughts and prayers. So I, I wanted to start out with that. I also want to mention that tonight we're going to be talking about uh, our NISA results, ACT results, and, and an opportunity to see things that we still have in front of us that are challenges and work that we have to do and talk about some of the efforts that we're going to be doing as well as look at some of the some of the uh, results specifically in NISA that we feel really good about so there's some good news and some bad news in that that we'll be talking about later tonight I also wanted to give a special congratulations tonight to North High School I'm holding in front of me the state championship award and we're going to be recognizing them in an upcoming board meeting uh, this will be three out of five years that north high school vikings have won the state championship in football and if you're able to go to the game it was an incredible game and uh, i can I, I really enjoyed watching that game but i will tell you i also enjoyed watching the burke game and that game was the same, just went back and forth. I see Mr. Williams, whose son plays for Burke High. That game was down to the last 10 seconds just as well. Two great teams representing Omaha Public Schools in a fantastic way. So proud of our, our kids and the work that they're doing and our coaches and the work that they're doing there. So with that, I'll turn it over to President America. All right, we'll move on to board member reports. Um, Mr. Snow. Thank you, Madam President. Um, an, an echo of Mr. Evans' comments again. Uh, congratulations, North High and Coach Martin. Uh, and you guys had an amazing pep rally, and it's always good uh, 
to support uh, players that put everything uh, that they have on the field. And also congratulations to Carney because I do have some family in Carney, so I have to say hello to them. Um, I had an opportunity to visit Walnut Hill uh, two weeks ago, uh, Mr. Norman's fifth grade math class, and I told the students I would give them a shout out during the board meeting. So Mr. Norman's fifth grade class, congratulations, here's your shout out. Um, also, I wanted to just give everyone an update. Uh, the Title I Open House, I saw Ms. Forte here, uh, is this Thursday from 5.30 to 6 o'clock uh, at the TAC building. Am I correct? 5.30 to 7.30, my bad. Also, the Central High Improv Night is from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. also this Thursday. And um, the McMillan Showcase is next Tuesday at McMillan Magnet from 5.30 to 8 p.m. December 5th. That's all. All right, Mrs. Godding. Well, several things. First, I want to give a shout out to the Burke PTO for putting on an incredible Burke bash. I think they were able to raise about $60,000 for the school at Burke bash the other night. And they also brought back a number of alumni who um, have been extremely successful in life, but also spoke passionately about um, what they see their um, future um, efforts toward Burke being. And so I just really appreciated the enthusiasm that they brought with the evening as well. I also had the opportunity to take a tour and I forgot Mr. Haynes, my glasses. Um, he gave me safety glasses, but I had a tour of um, the North High, not only the, um, the new area with all the manufacturing equipment, but also um, the engineering wing visited some of the classrooms there as well and saw some of the work that students are doing. It's quite impressive and just really a big thank you to the community um, on the manufacturing side, but also on the construction of the facilities themselves because it gives our students an opportunity to have um, just a little bit of an edge above everyone else when they head off to college, whether it be a four-year or two-year school. So I want to thank them. Then I also had the opportunity to um, attend Druid Hill while we had a couple of state senators with us and just wanted to compliment their staff. Um, I kind of messed up the students between a proper noun, common noun project and thought we were working on comprehension, but um, we got squared away and we got back on track before <laughs> the time was up. So I uh, just had a wonderful time being able to um, work with some students there, which was just a lot of fun. Mr. Perlman. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to recognize the uh, teachers and staff and PTA and all the families at Chandler View. I uh, was able to uh, attend a uh, benefit that they all worked really hard uh, putting together for one of their young students who wasn't doing so well. and. Uh, just a real amazing turnout that night. That was a, a, a couple weeks ago. Um, a lot of hard work going into that, that benefit. I also wanted to uh, recognize the Harrison PTA and their teachers and staff as well. They had their annual fundraiser, the Bright Bash. Uh, and it'll be probably the one and only year that I'll be able to go as a parent with my, with my uh, daughter in pre-K there. And that was a lot of fun. And again, a lot of hard work by uh, all the volunteers for that. So that was a good time. Um, I just had a couple of things that I want to share. I was able to, um, with Mrs. Godding, visit Druid Hill as well with our state senators and talk a little bit more about that when we get to our committee report. Um, that was a really good chance to get into into classrooms and see how our how our teachers handle working with students at different levels during their instructional time and the differentiation and activities that are going on every day. Um, and do want for the public to be aware that coming up in January, we do have our high school and middle school open houses um, for families that have students going into high schools or middle schools to be able to visit and see the different programs and things that are offered. I know I had some people ask me if we were doing that again, and we are. Um, those dates are available. I believe they're on the website, and I know they've been in a few OPS newsletters as well. You're not looking at me. Ms. Williams. Thank you, President Merica. So, um, unfortunately, I will not be at the next board meeting. My daughter is having a um, postponed surgery. Um, and so, prior to the, I, I just wanted to make that clear first and foremost. Um, second, 
Um, I want to shout out to all of the OPS fourth grade students that I had the opportunity to go see one half of the Nutcracker with on Friday, which was an awesome experience. I got to sit with uh, beloved my my, Bel my beloved Belvedere fourth grade class that I'm also a volunteer in um, Miss Main's class. So that was actually a lot of fun, um, and saw a lot of other schools that I recognize and teachers. Um, so that was very exciting, and I appreciate the opportunity and the invite. And lastly, um, as I won't be here at the next board meeting, um, I wanted to share a statement with the board. Um, I met with um, President Merica and Mr. Evans um, probably 15 minutes before our board meeting. Um, and first, let me start off by saying that uh, sometimes as, as a person, you have to make decisions that are best for yourself and your family. So I want to read the following statement to all of you. Dear President Merica and Superintendent Evans, for the past 1,639 days, I have served the constituents of Subdistrict 1, students, staff, and the community with much dedication, passion, and great pride. It has truly been a life-changing experience and has helped me grow in many areas of my life, both personally and professionally. At the start of the new year, I will be moving outside of the boundary lines of Subdistrict 1. As a result, it is with deep regret that I inform you today that I must officially resign from my seat as an OPS Board of Education member, effective at adjournment of this evening's meeting. I am informing the board at this time because it's crucial that the current board leadership have time to plan and prepare and give any interested constituents time to apply and hopefully be seated prior to the first meeting in January. I want to thank my constituents for putting your faith in me these past four years and seven months. It has truly been my privilege and honor to have represented you with due diligence and service since I began this role. I would also like to thank my employer, Partnership for Kids, and our president, Deb Denbeck, for their generous support of allowing me to serve this community on the Board of Education. However, Subdistrict 1 constituents, it is now time for one of you to represent the families, the students, and the staff of this great community. And I know that someone with great moral fiber and ethical value will step up to this challenge. To the OPS staff, past and present, you will always have a special place in my heart and indeed will always be a part of my extended family. I will continue to support OPS and public schools as I know firsthand the value the mission brings to our students inside the district and across Nebraska. And finally, the hardest. I want to acknowledge my three children who have sacrificed everything so that I could serve our community. But it is now time that you have the full support of the one parent that is in your life during all of our very unique and challenging life transitions. I want to thank the three of you for your patience through all of the sacrifices required for me to help serve as a voice and an advocate for 52,000 plus students. For your patience through criticism and financial burdens and balancing my duty as a volunteer on this board as well as my work-life balance and all the other things that took priority over our family. Respectfully, Yolanda R. Williams, OPS Board of Education, Subdistrict 1. I, I want to take a moment to share with all of you that um, this has been a very hard decision, but there are times as a person that you have to put your family first. I wouldn't change um, this experience for the world or for the service that I have given to this community because this is a community that I love. But I also have to put my family first. And these have been very hard decisions with them. Um, but I have to share with you that they're excited to have their mom back. Um, but sad because they know that my heart is in this work. And I'm blessed to work for an organization that serves only OPS and 12 schools that I've had the pleasure to get to know the students, the staff, and the family. But to those of you that um, have supported me, I appreciate. I appreciate it from the bottom of my heart, and I will never stop advocating for you. 
Um, and I just, I want to uh, have a couple of personal moments. So Lacey, I want to thank you for, we've had a great friendship. We've not always agreed, um, but you have really just been someone in my life that I'm grateful for and thank you for during this time. And we've had many great conference learning experiences. And it's, I mean, it's been, I wouldn't change that for the world, but I really want to acknowledge Mrs. Scotting two people that if you look at us, we are the very opposite of each other, night and day, west, east. Um, the, what we bring to the table is so very similar. And I just want to thank you for standing with dignity when you were under fire and the courage to represent every single student in this district, whether it was west, east, north, or south, you have truly been a leader on this board. And I just want you to know that the community does see it, but you have been a great friend, a great confidant, a great help in my personal and my professional life. And I admire you, and I'm blessed to have your friendship. So thank you. Uh, it's hard for me to say this, but uh, you've earned the right to spend time with your family the last, as you said, four years and seven months. Your dedication to 52,000 kids made a difference in their lives. There are things that we were able to do, even programs that we were able to pass, like school improvement grants that you voted for, that without your vote we couldn't have done that, and we're getting results at Wakanda Elementary. And I could go down the list of items that have changed as a result of what you've done for four years, seven months. And so from the bottom of my heart as superintendent, I, I thank you and 53,000 kids need to be thanking you right now. And I hope that you understand the difference you've made in their lives and, and of all the things in a voluntary role to understand that you've impacted lives. I, I hope you appreciate and value that, that you've changed their lives as, as well as some of us up here too because of your kindness, your thoughtfulness, and constant consideration for young people and not allowing personal and political issues to get in your way. And it's easy because it's a challenging role that all of you as voluntary board members take. And it's easy to suffer some of the slings and arrows that come with it and be impacted by it and to lose track or focus on our young people. You never did. You never wavered. So I thank you as superintendent, and it's been my blessing to serve with you for nearly five years. So thank you for that opportunity. And, and I wanted to say I, I hope on behalf of the whole board to, to thank you for, for the years of service you've been here and for the countless hours you put in and for just for being you and for bringing your voice and your your experiences in life and how that has impacted and formed you as a board member not just here but for students across the state um, I know I've been lucky to be involved with you not just here but in the state association um, and we have had some interesting adventures um, some more interesting than others but but I think we we have benefited greatly um, from everything that you've shared with us and your knowledge and experience. So thank you. Mrs. Gotting. I too just want to thank you so much for not only your friendship but for the leadership that we were able to have together for two years that seemed like 10 but <laughs> it was two. And, um, and what a blessing of a time that was. But um, I, I want your constituents to know that you represented them with an unbelievable amount of courage and um, just focus for not only them, but for every single student in this district. Um, you served on NASB very well and really helped as part of the steering in the strategic planning for the state association. You served this district through the work that you did at CUBE as our CUBE representative in an unbelievable way. You got to know lots of people. You learned um, things that other districts were doing that we could never have known about without you bringing that to the table. 
And I just pulled up, I had written um, something for Yolanda related to work that she did in Cube. And this is back in February of this year. And I wrote, I have the greatest respect for Yolanda's integrity, solid decision-making skills, and character. She is passionate about making decisions which will have positive long-term impacts on students. I have seen her have the courage time and time again to follow through on her convictions. She has been a strong advocate for students at the board table, in committee meetings, and in the community. Her knowledge base, due to the significant work the district has taken on, and by virtue of being in a leadership role, is far typical, is far greater than the typical board member who would have been on a board for only four years. Um, I can't thank you enough for the decision making that you did when we needed five votes to get things done for kids. Yours was a fifth vote that got things done. We now have the proper insurance coverage in the district. We got things done at um, Druid Hill. We got things done at Wakanda and so many other things thanks to your vote at the table. So um, you've made a huge difference for kids. And, uh, and you've been a blessing in my life, and uh, I'll always be grateful for your friendship, which will continue even though I will miss you tremendously on this board. Thank you for your service. Mr. Scanlon. Well, thank you very much for your service, Yolanda. Um, I mean, you've, you've been a very, um, I mean, I'm bummed out that you're uh, that you've moved, but uh, I appreciate everything you've done uh, for the board and for OPS um, during your time. It's been um, rough times that we've all been through, to say the least, and we've tackled a lot of tough issues. and And I think that um, you know I've always respected your input um, and you know bringing things to my attention that maybe I didn't consider or uh, understand fully and, and I just um, I think that um, you know you've done a you've done a fab fabulous job at um, not just standing up for the kids where sometimes you have a lot of adults pushing you in opposite directions but you know what was right for kids and and uh, I think a lot of us have had to to uh, you know put aside you know politics and everything and say what's best for kids and I think you've done that and um, you know I just I, it's been an honor to serve with you and uh, I wish you the best in whatever life brings you next so thank you Mr. Snow thank you Madam President um, thank you for your service Ms. Williams um, and also dedicating your time uh, that you could be spending with your family um, leading this board as a board officer for two years. Um, uh, one of the things I, I want to say is that your work will not be forgotten and it will continue in the district. And one of those examples was you uh, challenging this district to step up our, our inclusion plan uh, that we did come up with one uh, to help diversify and help spread uh, the bond work that we have in this district to people in North and South Omaha and small and emerging businesses. So thank you for everything you've done and best wishes. Indeed. Again, thank you. Um, we will definitely miss you. But like you said, you are not, you are not leaving, leaving. You're just going on a new adventure. Um, Yes, I think we should do a round of applause. <laughs> um, and just for, for anyone in the public and for our board members, we will, um, we do have to accept any resignations to the board since that wasn't on our posted agenda we can't do that tonight so that will be on our agenda for our next meeting um, and we will also bring um, a timeline as far as what the next steps look like after that for identifying and appointing a new board member for sub district all right um, 
We will then move on to public comment. Mr. Ray, do you have any additional forms? No. Okay. Um, we have nine speakers who have requested submitted request to speak forms. The board has adopted policy 8346, which provides public comment for a period of one hour. That same policy limits individual speakers to a maximum of five minutes, and we ask that you please respect that time limit. Mr. Ray will let you know when you have one minute remaining and when you have 30 seconds remaining. If you are in need of an interpreter, please let Mr. Ray know and one will be provided for you. Um, we ask that you respect the opinions of all who speak and that you refrain from applause or other outbursts during presentations. And if the subject of your public comment is related to a particular student or staff member, we ask that you not mention that person by name and instead provide them information to Mr. Ray so he can assist us in looking into those types of specifics. Uh, if you would like to submit any written commentary, please give a copy to Mr. Ray and he will make sure that each board member receives one. Um, and as a reminder, we ask that you state and spell your name and your address, state your address before you begin your public comment. It is now 7.13 p.m. and our first speaker is Daniel Patrick Holm. Thank you. Hi, my name, my name is Daniel Patrick Holm. I live at Five zero zero nine. It's a street. Number R. Uh, Pascal six eight one three two. I'm with my mom. I'm here to ask you to get this of new train station program for PBA in Korea. So no, I'm going to PBA, but that means that such such pain such such is is a. Then you are producers, my coach, supplies, etc. We don't have to move things in and out every day. Make the OPS transition program a great program for all students. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. All right, and our second speaker is Mary McHale. That's you, Mommy. I know. <laughs> My name is Mary P. McHale, MC, capital H-A-L-E, and I live at 5009 Izzard Street, Omaha, Nebraska, 68132. And I thank the OPS school board members and OPS staff for all you do for the students of OPS. I'm here tonight to talk about the transition program, which has approximately 166 students in three locations who receive special education services between 18 and 21 years of age. The purpose of the transition program is to provide the students with job and life skills training. I thank all of the board members who took the time to do the research into what currently exists for the transition program at all the sites. I also thank you for including it in your workshop and for going beyond what I had originally talked about, replacing the PBA transition program only, and for including career center transition as another possibility. I absolutely agree that this option is the best option for the, as the transition program should not be at a school site, which is what the career center is. Have a site big enough for all aspects of the transition program, including the daily living skills portion. As you heard my son, Daniel Holm, say, make the OPS transition program a great program for all students. They deserve it. I know there are many other deserving projects that are under consideration for the 2018 bond issue, but this is a program with over 166 students that continues to increase every year. Every student, every day, prepared for success. Please continue to remember these students, like my son, who deserve the same consideration for the physical site accommodations as the other OPS students. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you. Our third speaker is Terrell McKinney. How you doing? My name is Terrell McKinney. I reside at 4948 Spartan Street, Omaha, Nebraska, 68104. I'm here because of the test scores I've seen over the past week. And it's under my understanding that OPS is operating on a larger budget, but it's doing worse than other districts across the state. It's time that we hold our elected officials, board members, and community leaders accountable 
for the overall expectations of our kids, which have been lowered in order to boost statistics, athletics, and to receive money. This problem has went on far too long, and it's unacceptable. We can't just blame parents and students for these problems, which, I, which I've seen over the past couple of days. This is a systematic issue, and it's clear the district and the board doesn't really care to solve this problem anytime soon. Those ACT scores are a reflection of an uncommitted and unorganized school district that would rather expel our kids, pay a man a million dollars to pretend to care for a year, and not provide effective black leadership and direction in areas of the community that are underserved. The school to prison pipeline in Omaha, Nebraska is alive and well. Thank you. Thank you. Our fourth speaker is Nayalip Nial. Hello. Sorry, I'm kind of tall. My name is Naya Leap. Um, I reside in 3718 North 36th Street here in Omaha, Nebraska, 68111. I am 22 years old. I've, um, I'm an alumni of Omaha North High School, so shout out to the Vikings. I've been going to OPS um, my entire life, and the reason why I decided to come here today and speak with you guys, um, this is my first time coming to one of these meetings, but I felt very compelled um, what I have in my hand here is about 47 students um, that I had. I have an organization called Youth for Good or Good, and we kind of help out South Sudanese kids here. And one of our um, earlier sessions, we've asked them, you know, what is something that you feel like you're struggling with in school or what's your concerns? And we have a lot of students that go to various different schools, but a majority of the OPS students, they've um, stressed that. Sorry, let me put my phone up with some notes. Um, <clears throat> just kind of an overview of the three things that I kept seeing recurring and being brought back up is bullying um, and racism within the classrooms. It leaves them very uncomfortable and the environment for them as far as the teaching is just, is just not good. Um, and then as far as teachers go, they feel like they're not getting a lot of the help that they need. Um, they do sometimes hold some type of resentment for teachers allowing bullying to happen or for them not standing up to them or you know defending them. And the students, they're not retaining what's being taught, and there's little to no extra help um, for them outside of the school classroom. And so that kind of just leaves them caring, like feeling like, why do I bother? Why do I care? And within the South Sudanese community, there's a lot of um, high school dropouts. If they do graduate, they don't really do much outside of that. They don't go to college. They just don't really, they don't, you know, that drive isn't there. And then also lack of school involvement. A lot of South Sudanese kids, um, besides sports, you really won't see them elsewhere as far as school goes. And I don't know if that's because they just don't know about what's being offered or they're not, um, you know, whatever the, the case may be. But there's a very, there's a huge lack of South Sudanese involvement as far as school goes. And so I'm standing here um, speaking on behalf of South Sudanese children. There's about 20,000 or more of us here in Omaha, Nebraska. So the community is very large. and. Um, basically, we want to involve ourselves in Omaha. We want to be a part of the discussion that's being held. We want to also take part in finding the solutions because our children are pretty much suffering in silence right now. They don't really have anyone to advocate for them or any programs or anything like that. So that's pretty much what I um, wanted to say. Thank you for hearing me. All right. Thank you. Our fifth speaker tonight is Gwen Easter. Good evening. Um, my name is Gwen Easter. I live at 2895 Benny Street. Um, I forgot what else. Is that all I need to say? <laughs> um, well, I wanted to come before you all to talk about the the test scores too. Um, I feel that uh, <laughs> it's such an embarrassment what has uh, taken place with these scores and. Um, for the Omaha Public School System to say that uh, every student, every day, er, prepared for success, our kids are not being prepared for success. All kids need to be prepared for success, and that's not happening in our public school system. Um, we shouldn't be proud that we have kids um, not reading, uh, reading below grade level. We should should not be proud that um, that our school system 
is not supporting children and families in the way that they portray out to the public. Uh, I need to also say that I, I'm, I have been appointed uh, by the governor to sit on the Early Childhood Interagency Coordinating Council to be a voice for child care providers. And in our community, um, our school system has failed our kids for decades. And it is this continuous cycle. And now you all want to have early childhood education a part of the school system, to, which will continue the cycle because you have no measurable outcomes. Um, y'all partner with, with y'all bring people into our community, and you partner and you set up all these programs, and then you force out those in our community who have been here, like my organization, Safe Haven Community Center, Safe Haven Early Childhood Preschool Education Academy, who has been trying to help support kids for decades as well, and others, and then and then you all do you're doing nothing different. You're doing nothing to, to support the children. I mean, there are kids who are getting help, but there's a large number of kids who are being failed. And just like the gentleman said, you're just creating this systematic cycle. And we have, and you're working with these or outside organizations, these um, leaders who are supposed to be representing our community and our children, and, 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 and they're doing nothing. You're, you're following the lead of, of a, of, of a Sherwood Foundation and all these other organizations, but you're not helping our children, you're not helping our families. I mean, I don't know what it's going to take for kids to have a right to be educated. They have a right to be educated. You put, I mean, you, you know, we try, I've always tried to work with organizations, daycares, or whoever in our community, but uh, we get pushed out and, and then you all set up these other programs and they're doing nothing. To me, you all are babysitters. The school system are babysitting our children because you're not educating our kids, not all of them. And they deserve that. They deserve I don't know if it's going to take, what, a lawsuit to be filed? Maybe parents should start filing lawsuits against the school system so then they can take the money and, and help get their kids into a private schools or something. But something needs to change. This pipeline of prison and all, all this stuff, I mean, the, the, the foster care system, all of this stuff that is, is, is um, working against our families and our children, especially low-income families. And then we want to blame poverty when, when you all get fun, some fundings to help families in this, in the, if, if they're in a need. But a majority, a lot of those families don't get any help. Now, there's a few schools that, do serve, that, that will provide some kind of utility or rent assistance. But but majority of the families get told they can't get any help. So I mean we need to stop using certain these things as a as an excuse. One we need minute. to stop focus on uh, homosexuality, comprehensive sex education, all these other things, and and start educating, teaching our kids how to read, how to write, so they can be prepared for school, for college, for uh, uh, trade school, or whatever it is that they decide to do. But you all are failing. Our, I'm, and I say I'm saying as a whole. This system is failing our kids, our families, and our community. And it needs to change. It's going to change because we, we're going to keep coming back. We're going to keep going and seconds. talking to the legislatures and others to do something about this. This has got to end. Thank you. Thank you. Our sixth speaker is Carrie Potts. Hi, my name is Carrie Potts, K-A-R-I-P-O-T-T-S, and I reside at 10725 North 50th Avenue. I'm a proud graduate of Ponca Elementary School, Nathan Hale Junior High, and North High School. And I am a proud parent of a second grader at Ponca Elementary School and a sixth grader at Davis Middle School. The art of communication is the language of leadership. This quote accurately summarizes why I'm here tonight. I am pleading with OPS to execute with leadership. I fully support Matthew Picota as Ponca's principal. I am not here tonight because of the individual serving in a role. I am confident Mr. Picota will wonderfully serve Ponca when he is there. I am here tonight because the removal of Ponca's principal was handled in a manner that showed virtually no respect for the students of Ponca Elementary. While my issues with the handling of this matter are varied, in the interest of time, I will narrow it to three. One, the timing of the removal of our principal was extremely concerning. 
It is hard to fathom a scenario where a mid-semester remover of a principal is warranted. The departure of Wakanda's principal had already occurred. That school, unfortunately, was already disrupted. It is shocking that an interim fix was not considered for Wakanda, which had already been disrupted, to avoid disrupting three schools, Wakanda, Ponca, and Catlin. OPS hired two additional executive directors this year that I am to understand are charged with guiding principals. Surely they are qualified to lead a school at least until semester. My second point, the communication to parents on this issue was abysmal. As the parent of a fourth generation, as the parent of fourth generation OPS students, I implore you, do better. Communication is key. We are craving it as a community, as taxpayers, and as parents. My third point is that the lack of guidance and data to support the decision to have a principal support two schools is lacking and does not appear to be forthcoming. The excuse I have been given for the principal serving two schools is enrollment. If by enrollment you mean budgetary considerations, I would ask that you provide evidence supporting such a statement. I have requested that information and to date have not received it. I have also requested supporting documentation evidencing that OPS is confident that this model of a principal serving two schools will succeed. To be sure, the part-time principal is not the issue. I am well aware that Ponca has had a part-time principal for several years. The issue is requiring one person who even with the best of intentions will have extreme difficulty serving two schools. A principal is vital to a school. As stated by Dundee, our blue ribbon school, they said, what, what was the first thing they told you? The principal, the bedrock of the school. Just ask any child whose face lights up when the principal calls them by their name in the morning. Currently, my child gets that on Tuesday and Thursdays. OPS uses the tagline, every student, every day, prepared for success. I am confident that you don't mean to intend every student, every other day, prepared for success. Thank you. Thank you. Our seventh speaker is Sarah Duncan. Good evening. My name is Sarah Duncan, uh, Sarah with an H, last name D-U-N-C-A-N, -N, and my address is 9821 Hartman Avenue, 68134. I am also here to express my concern regarding the decision to assign a dual role principal between Ponca and Catlin Elementary. Uh, I believe a decision like this is one that should have been made very carefully, and it appears that was not done. I believe, and I would imagine you all agree that to have a healthy and successful school, the schools and the students need administrators who are dedicated and assigned to one school as that school's leader, not split between two schools. I also believe the success and the continued success of the students and the school is hindered by the time constraints that are put on the administrator in this situation. They are essentially being tasked with doing two jobs at once in a given week. I think that this is a valid concern based on the requirements of a school that a principal would not be able to effectively do their job, not based on who they are as an individual or their capabilities, but simply based on the time constraints that exist in splitting time between two elementary schools. Uh, it has nothing to do with the credentials of the individual or their capabilities. It simply has to do with the part-time nature of this role. I think that the benefit to the schools and the community is so much greater when there are principals assigned individually as leaders to their own separate and individual schools. Uh, or at the very least, if not full time, as I understand Ponca's principal has not been, at least dedicate one principal to each school. I think that this, that's a much better solution than experimenting with an unproven model and making s two schools share an administrator. I think that these decisions should be made in the best interests of each student in each school, uh, not based on the interests of the school system. Uh, I really see no objective benefit to either school in splitting their principal between two schools. I would understand if this was a temporary or an interim situation through the end of the year, but this appears to be a permanent decision. 
And I think this is the perfect time frame to examine this situation as we are only we are only heading into halfway through the year. Um, I think that if one of the roles of the board is to ensure that decisions by the administration are being made in the best interests of the students and communities that you represent, then this decision requires further review and consideration and change and a review of the policies that guided this decision, as there's really no evidence that I've been provided that splitting a principal between two schools in a district of this size and type is appropriate or necessary, or that it's simply objectively the right decision for each of these schools. I understand that there's an argument that Ponca's elementary school principal was already part-time, but they also believe there's a vast difference between a part-time principal who had an administrative role and a part-time principal who is splitting their time and their leadership role between the two schools. Um, I'd like you to lastly just consider the future of both of these schools to make sure that they continue to be well managed and well administered and whether a split dual role principal would accomplish those goals. Thank you. Thank you. Our eighth speaker is Melissa Bieber. Okay. Good evening. Uh, my name is Melissa Bieber, M-E-L-I-S-S-A B-E, B as in boy, E-R. I reside at 8315 North 47th Street here in Omaha, 68152. I'm also here to comment tonight about the shared principal responsibilities between Ponk Elementary and Catlin. Um, but before I share my comments, I do want to express my support for Principal Pakoda. I'm sure he'll do an amazing job. However, I do have a concern as a parent um, in that how will I know that this arrangement that has been made will be successful for not only Ponka, but for, more importantly for, <clears throat> excuse me, my daughter as a third grader. Um, it's very easy to look back and report out how much time the principal is being, how much time the principal is spending at the school on a part-time basis. But I'd like to know, um, I'd like to know there are measures of success identified before this arrangement has been made to truly, in order to truly be able to see the same, if not better outcomes for Ponca. To my knowledge, the measures of success of this arrangement have not been shared with the parents of Ponca Elementary. Thank you. Thank you. And our final speaker is Gina Miller. Good evening, Gina Miller, G-I-N-A-M-I-L-L-E-R, 4511 North 167th Street. Um, first, I'd like to start off by um, giving my sincere thank you for Miss Yolanda's service and your passion for kids and your support. Um, I am here this evening to speak about the ACT results. Um, so the ACT results got released. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion amongst the board members. And I'm very, very interested in um, how, how we as a district move forward. Um, I personally dislike immensely standardized testing. Um, I don't like the time that's spent in test prep in our schools. I don't like that it's a snapshot on, our, on one day of our kids' performance. Um, with that said, unfortunately, as a district, we have to have some kind of a benchmark, some kind of a line, I guess, to be able to compare ourselves to others and within the district and against other districts. And um, I haven't been able to figure out how to do that otherwise than some type of a state or uh, local standardized testing, unfortunately. Um, so I think everyone, especially everyone in this room or this board, knows uh, the, the issues and everything that's been thrown out all weekend. It's poverty, it's family engagement, it's curricula, it's effective teachers, it's too large a class sizes, it's too large a schools, there's too much mean money being spent, there's not enough money being spent, there's too much money on administration, not enough in the classroom teacher, there's mental health issues, lack of respect from students in the classrooms, apathetic students, apathetic parents. I've heard and seen all of it this weekend and I don't necessarily agree with any of those, um, but it is what everybody is talking about has been talking about for decades um, and there's plenty of issues what I do know is what this district has done 
We have medical access for students. We have extended the school day. We have some of the highest paid teachers in the area. We've created executive directors. We have social workers, psychiatrists, counselors, police officers. We are training teachers and administrators about diversity, cultural competencies. We are recruiting for diverse candidates at all levels of the organization. We as a community have an entire organization and millions of dollars in the learning community focused on poverty issues. We are doing a lot of things and we're not seeing results. I don't have the answers. Um, I, I know I would be sharing it readily with all of you if I did. Um, but I really have been thinking about this for years and I know I've had conversations with, with several of you about this. Um, because I know what the great work that is being done at the school level in each classroom by our teachers and by our kids and I know how hard our, for the majority our kids are working and trying to meet expectations and achievements. But so, so where is the disconnect? Why are the scores what they are? Why is the uproar? And I think it's because the scores are not what we, the parents, and we, the community, have been being told. How can we, on a consistent basis, say we're getting better? How can I go to every single parent-teacher's conference and say my kid is doing great? How can I see every quarter, at the end of the quarter, the honor roll, and there's 90% of the kids in the school on honor roll? How can that be? I, 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 per, I perceive an education system as a bell curve where the majority of the kids are proficient and then there's high, high, high academic children and there's some that are struggling that need support. And I don't seem to see, and maybe it's, maybe it's a definition thing. What is proficient? Maybe we need to be better about what is the definition of proficient in, One this, minute. Dis, in this district. I don't see how my child who struggles in math and is at a lower level math class is getting an A in math is on the same honor roll as her best friend who is in advanced placement math. They're both getting A's and they're both on the same honor roll. That, there's a disconnect to me on how we're sharing information with parents. And are we moving these children along the right way? 30 seconds. I think I would rather have my child in an advanced placement class getting a C than in a lower level math class that maybe she's not challenged in and getting an A. But I'm kind of following the teacher's lead. They said don't move her up any faster because she's going to struggle and that and now I'm kicking myself. Why why am I following that advice? Why shouldn't have I put her in advanced placement class? And again, I hate it when people say when I was in school, it's not the same. It's not the same. But That's when I time. was in school, everybody had the same classes and people got A's, C's and D's. So just something to think about as we go forward with these conversations. Thank you. All right, thank you. And thank you to everyone who came for public comment tonight. I do hope that especially those of you who came and talked about ACT scores and test results do stay um, for the presentation and conversation that we're going to have in a little bit on that topic. Um, might refresh it. We'll move on to item I, which is our consent agenda. Um, and I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda before us. So moved. Second. Okay. We have a motion by Ms. Williams and a second by Mrs. Godding. Um, are there any abstentions? Hearing none, roll call please, Mr. Ray. Perlman. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Scanlon. Abstain. Snow? Aye. Williams? Aye. Godding? Aye. Six aye. Um, do I get to vote? Sorry. I'm really not doing well today. Sorry. America? Aye. Six aye. Six aye, one abstention. So motion carries. Uh, we will move on to item J. Um, we do not have any action items this evening, but we have several information items. Um, and I was, as we get that pulled up, I was kind of talking earlier point. about this is kind of the board member request meeting. Um, Just a point of order. Since yes. we have so many people here who talked about 
would it be possible to move up the um, information item on um, NISA scores? Just, or or do, are we having fairly short presentation here? And I'm okay with that too. I, I mean, that all depends on board discussion and how much discussion we have. Because <clears throat> um, I do know we have some people that are here specifically for the bullying presentation as well. Um, if there are other board members that feel strongly, we could definitely. How, how long rearrange. is the bullying presentation? 10 minutes? 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. And, and then board questions if okay okay um, so we will move on to our first presentation then on bullying awareness and prevention um, which as I mentioned so this was a specific request that the board receive an update on what we are doing to Try to prevent bullying in our schools and take action when bullying is identified. Just use your note. Okay. Yep. Whoops. All right. Good morning, members of the board, President America, Vice President Snow. Superintendent Evans, we appreciate the opportunity to provide information to you around bullying. You will notice that there's a multitude of departments here as well as a principal to present this. Um, that's because we are very passionate and care around the prevention and awareness of bullying, also how we respond, and then also intervene when bullying does occur, not just with the student who has been bullied, but also the student who has done the bullying. So it is with great honor that um, I would like to introduce the presenters. We have Nancy Bond, who is in charge of our counseling department. We have Keegan Corp with our IMS department. We have Matt Williams, who is principal of Mount View Elementary School, and then Lisa Utterback, who's an executive director of the Office of School Support and Office of Community School and Family Engagement. Good evening, Board of Education and Superintendent Evans. I'm Nancy Bond, and I want to thank you for this invitation tonight to share the efforts of many district staff who are working to promote positive youth development. Uh, which at the same time protects students from a variety of risk behaviors. This evening we have been asked to address specific efforts as they relate to raising awareness and preventing students from engaging in rela behaviors related to bullying. To begin, we believe it's important to define bullying as there is often confusion with regard to the distinction between bullying behaviors and a conflict. A conflict is a disagreement that happens when people want different things. The people involved in a conflict have equal power to resolve the problem. They are not trying to hurt one another. Bullying is unfair and one-sided. It happens when someone keeps hurting, frightening, threatening, or leaving someone out on purpose. Bullying requires three conditions, an imbalance of power, repetition, and intention to harm. The Omaha Public Schools strives to create a focus on the importance of relationships, on school-wide behavioral expectations, and on a culture of kindness and empathy. There are a multitude of ways that administrators, teachers, and staff model and encourage kindness each and every day in our schools. Tonight, we will highlight just a few of the ways that we prepare our staff and our students to embrace kindness. First, you'll hear about our curriculum, Common Sense Media, is delivered through our library services, career education, human growth and development. Our second step and steps to respect uh, programs are delivered through our school counseling lessons. Our student support teams, our school counselors, our social workers, and our psychologists work to support students and staff. And you'll hear about our instructional discipline framework and our student code of conduct.
Good evening, members of the board, Superintendent Evans. Um, my name is Keegan Korf. I'm the lead teacher of digital citizenship um, in partnership with Common Sense Media in our IMS department. Um, and tonight I just want to discuss um, the fact that as our district increases access to technology in the classroom, we want to ensure that we're really intentionally teaching students to be safe, smart, and ethical creators and consumers of digital media as well. Um, bullying looks a little bit different today than it did uh, many years ago um, and we want to ensure that we're addressing um, appropriate behavior online as well as face to face and in real life so using common sense education curriculum every school in our district is teaching lessons on digital citizenship through library career and tech ed classes and human growth and development in addition to other courses or differentiated school plans um, some of the student benefits that we see uh, for learning digital citizenship and creating a culture of kindness in our schools are that they have an understanding of how to use technology as a tool for learning and positive social engagement. They have an awareness of how to handle and stand up to cyberbullying, and they have an enhanced engagement from parents in the community due to a whole community approach to digital citizenship education. Um, we know that what we are teaching in the classroom um, is extremely important, but that can't be supported if we don't provide the proper education to parents in the community as well. So that's um, definitely an effort that we're addressing through common sense media and common sense education. Good evening, and as we've talked about bullying prevention, it's really about looking at the social and emotional development of students. We know that when students know better and they're taught within the walls of the school, they do better. And we teach and we model and we reteach the behaviors and actions that we expect. And so when we talk about bullying prevention, it's really identifying in the walls of each school is what is bullying, what does it look like, and what does it sound like, and what's happening in the classroom, in those common areas, as well as the PAC facilitators, the counselors, and the administrators to really address those issues with the support of parents. When you think of um, electronics today, uh, how one click of a button on a Saturday night could cause all kinds of issues within the walls of the school and really what what perimeters do we have to be able to intervene and offer supports well when you look at bullying intervention it's really about the teachers because if it doesn't happen in the classroom it's not going to happen and we know that our young people are coming to us today some young people are coming and they're modeling and emulating the behaviors that they learn in the home and in the walls of the school and behavior and bullying is definitely a form of communication and so we want to be proactive in everything that we do to ensure that to ensure that it's really about instructional discipline that our kids have an opportunity from the time they enter the walls of school and early childhood education to graduating from high school that they work with their classmates um, I give a shout out I saw Mrs. Cox Jones here about Skinner Magnet Center doing teaching kindness and taking the time to do that and so we really want to um, model and have high expectations for our every student that comes into our school and we know that we do have some young people that have some challenges and I can tell you in working with some of the parents um, they have challenges with these young kids too and so with our parental engagement activities really helping our parents from school to school understand what the issues are through trauma and providing supports with connections counseling in the schools and then really um, teaching and modeling and reteaching what's expected um, at this time I'd like to turn it over to mr. Matt Williams who's done an incredible job at Mount View working with young people on really identifying what's the difference between bullying and peer conflict but when that happens too to make sure that we effectively and efficiently address those issues so kids understand what's acceptable and we want to make sure that all students feel comfortable when they come into the walls of our school because we know that the challenges in the community can be brought into the walls of the school and create issues so mr. Williams good evening everybody um, so basically how we deal with the situation, uh, wh whether uh, a bullying report is brought to us by a parent, a student, another staff member, uh, the first thing we try to do is identify is it bullying or not based on that three criteria. Um, and, and then we try to move from there. Um, 
we always try to have the teachers resolve that conflict in the classroom whenever possible because then it's instructional discipline again. We try to have them work with the students and both students, both the student that um, is uh, reportedly doing the bullying and the student that is reportedly being bullied because there's some work there that we have to do on, on both sides and some teaching that we need to do. Um, from there, if we can't get something solved at the classroom level, we, I, what we do at Mount View is we move it through our counselor. Counselor then does work with whether it's peer mediation or conflict resolution um, and, and see what we can get done there. Um, if we can't get it done there, then it comes to me and then we end up with code of conduct of violations and things like that and, and we work it through that way. But we really try to work it through um, instructionally um, because I, I can throw a consequence out all day. That's not going to solve a problem. That doesn't get a kid doing the bullying or the kid being bullied to feel better about it, to um, how to handle it and all of those kind of things. Um, one, one of the biggest pieces of this for me, um, I think, really comes to communication um, and helping our children learn and our parents learn how to report and when to report. Um, because if we don't know there's an issue, that pattern, I think, sorry about that, we talked about that pattern. Um, if we don't know something's happening, uh, we can't act on it. Um, so that's a really big piece, I think, that communication piece that goes through that um, and, and that working with parents and what's going on. So that's how we handle it at the school. And also, many schools have assemblies. They focus on character counts, and they really reward and acknowledge the success of young people that are um, standing up and advocating for what's right because Many times there's things that happen amongst kids over the weekend or um, on the playground that's not brought to the attention of the administrators. And so really cultivating environments where kids are student ambassadors and our schools are safe zones. And so there does come a time, though, when I provided each of you with a packet on the policy that you update every year as well as the code of conduct. And there are some times when bullying does occur and you've used a multitude of levels that you need to really have a heavy hand and enforce some discipline to ensure that the student that is doing the bullying as well as um, the individual that's being bullied and the families are aware that we take this very serious and we also I want to mention too though it's very important when you are dealing with the bully that you understand that there are some issues there as well and um, again that's a form of communication too and so providing those wraparound supports for all students involved and sometimes it involves getting the family at the table to say help us help you and so when you look at the code of conduct there's a multitude of disciplinary actions that take place but we always really like to be proactive on the front end and, and ensure that everybody understands what are our expectations in the walls of the school and when it does happen we address it we did put in there the student um, incident report uh, for bullying and sometimes schools use their actual incident reports to get the investigation started and again sometimes it's that peer conflict but also it can be a level of bullying and when it is a addressed and it does occur again that's when the consequences become more severe and we have to ensure that all kids are safe within the walls of the school and you know I like to just end by saying that it's really about when we know better we do better and when you look at the responsibilities um, that educators have the role of what we do in the walls of the school has changed um, we are now expected to teach behaviors um, those social emotional skills to kids as well as um, peer interaction to ensure that they understand what's acceptable in the walls of the school and we build the capacity on them each and every day with instruction but also taking time to focus on those social skills thank you all right um, board member questions comments mr. snow <clears throat> Thank you, Madam President. Um, uh, the packet sets from you, Ms. Ms. Soderbeck. Um, so I have just a couple questions. Um, first of all, thank you guys for the presentation. Um, uh, bullying does happen in our schools. Mm -hmm. It happens in as a child, and it happens in our adult lives as mm -hmm. it is. Um, uh, the first question is tracking. Is this a district form or yes. school form? Yeah, that's a form that um, the counseling department put out several years ago with the steps to success. And that's a form that also schools can use. It's very similar that schools use on the incident reporting. And depending on the um, skill level of a student, an adult might ask those probing questions or students might write out in their, their wording on an actual sheet of what happened. And then we're able to, to track that information to be able to proceed forward with an investigation. Perfect. 
Um, the, the next question is the MTSSB multiple tier systems of support. Mm -hmm. There was a online component where principals and teachers could track mm -hmm. student. They could pull up a student and find out how many times they were tardy, how many incidences they had. Uh, is, is this in any way kind of correlate, or how, how are you able to track that? And the, re the reason why I'm saying this is if a student got removed from one school to another, mm -hmm. how did those schools interact if the student's being transferred? Well, I would have to tell you if a student is being transferred because of discipline, that would be housed through the Office of Community Schools and Family Engagement, and the reassignment team would look at the student, look at the behaviors, and then also look at the most suitable placement. And then when that placement's made, our office facilitates an intake meeting with the incoming school and the family to ensure that everybody understands um, what's at stake. Because sometimes kids just need an opportunity to hit that reset button, and it's about setting kids up for success. And all behaviors behaviors are tracked in Infinite Campus as well. Thank you. Any other board? Mrs. Godding. So I know we do a lot and I know just having had three kids that are almost all the way through, two kids through the system, I know it's tough to sometimes get all the information. I think the kids who I'm most concerned about are the ones who, as you said, don't communicate. Mm -hmm. They're afraid, oh, if I tell you, I'm going to get beat up when I get a block off of campus or whatever is going to happen. And so I guess how do we as adults in the, in the school setting uh, make ourselves aware of those little things that are happening so that we can prevent or we can reach out to a child and say, hey, I noticed today that you seem a little bit what's going on in your life or something like that and I guess I think back to a young man whose mom shared with me a few years ago that he actually won a four-year scholarship to college because of um, his essay on being bullied all the way through middle school and how he mentally um, was in anguish over it and then you know just persevered and was able to get through it and so but I don't think any adult ever realized what was actually probably happening to him. And so, and, and he didn't communicate that back, I'm sure. But how do we as adults make ourselves, what do we do for professional development training to help um, the adults in the building really think about, hey, there's something I think going on over here? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it, it boils down to, you know, those positive and engaging and welcoming welcoming school climates, high staff visibility, making sure that your staff are visible from the time the student enters to school and has an adult that you can greet, good morning, how are you? Also getting to know your students um, and then having those conversations. I know MTSSB is really about adult behavior and making sure that the adults in the building are aware, getting to know your students and then through your ongoing counseling lessons um, that you have and then also the the Positive Action Center, really being uh, aware of your students and then also having those relationships with your parents that when things when things are not going well, um, there's things that happen that a child may not want to bring into the walls of the school, but when a parent can make a, a healthy phone call or send an email to a teacher, it's kind of an APB to everybody to say, hey, um, keep an eye out on this student, do a check-in. It's, you know, it's ongoing, it's job embedded, but it's really about knowing your students. And, you know, I will say, though, unfortunately, there are times that you could have the most successful student athlete or um, IB student or a student that is very quiet and withdrawn. And if you're not aware of things, you cannot address it. And so that's why it's been a mission back in the days of SSDS under Dr. Bond to really be proactive and have high staff visibility in the schools to make sure that you know your students doing activities and then being in those transition periods as well as those common areas because some of that, that stuff can happen. And then when there is a conflict, bringing people together and having dialogue and working it out and sometimes it's peer conflict opposed to bullying, but then also communicating back with the parents as well. And, you know, there are some kids, social media, I'll tell you, the phones, um, what one person can do on social media with the click of a button can be devastating. But we don't, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, we do not patrol Facebook and um, I think MySpace, my son says I'm a little outdated. But really being aware of those Facebook things. Anymore. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're or Instagram, <laughs> Instagram. Yeah. But really having ambassadors in the school, empowering students through your, um, 
through your uh, student ambassadors as well as your um, character counts and spotlighting the successes and that's what a lot of schools do is they really spotlight the success of young people that are um, making a difference in the walls of the school and recognizing that behavior of coming forward because together we're stronger. Um, and kind of related to that communication piece on slide six um, it said that we were working on establishing kind of an anonymous hotline for people to call in if you know they're stealing bill bullying or being bullied but don't feel comfortable going to someone do we have a timeline for when we hope that to implement that we are working as quickly quickly as we can to try to establish uh, actually we have another meeting yet this week uh, to get a hotline established but we really feel that that um, point of contact that students have who they may not want to share it with someone they know but that anonymous mechanism is really a, a, a gap that we really hope to close so we're, we're working very quickly to um, to have that opportunity um, for our students so that 24-7 uh, we currently utilize the Boys Town National Hotline and we have all of our um, students in our district you'll see the posters you see the the business cards uh, and it, we do encourage um, students to utilize the Boys Town National Hotline uh, but we're looking at a dedicated line um, for uh, an OPS safe schools hotline mr. snow thank you um, so most students that are bullies uh, didn't just become a bully overnight uh, they were either bullied themselves or there's something going at home. Uh, what is the district doing for students that are doing the bullying in the schools? Um, because too often you might have that student that's in high school bullying. If they're in high school and they're bullying students still, that means they were doing it most likely in elementary and middle school. So mm -hmm. what is the school district doing, not just on a council level, but teachers and administrators doing to help that child that is doing the bullying so they can address it because most students I would say that are bullying probably don't know that they're bullying until it's mm -hmm. too late or you know not even conscious of it they think they're just being kids but mm -hmm. they're not understanding the trauma that they're causing the other student right. mr. Snow, that's a very important point and I really okay. think it goes down to bullying is a form of communication and a bully has issues as well thus it's a cry for help sometimes and it could range from you know depending on the developmental age of working with the school counselor working with the PAC facilitator um, we have had many students referred to connections um, for mental health support as well as that family structure we also have um, uh, peer intervention groups in the in the schools with our counselors to work on those behaviors uh, mentoring there's a lot of silent mentoring that happens with adults in the building as well as our partnership that that we've embarked on recently with Midlands mentoring um, getting those young people some supports and we have a litany of parents we were here you were here that night when parents were standing up and saying OPS help me help my child and so providing all those wraparound supports because those students need our support too. in fact they're the ones that need us the most Yes, um, I, I do remember the Midlands mentoring event uh, here for those students there. Um, and I just would like to take a point of privilege of just saying any parent that is out there, any family member that your child is being bullied or is bullying other students, there are mentoring organizations out there, uh, a lot of nonprofits out there that work with your student. Mm -hmm. um, and if we could find a way as a board to help direct that I can do that myself I'm sure what's her name I'm sorry Danita Webb, Danita Webb. is the uh, mentoring specialist for OPS and Midlands mentoring um, and I, I really do believe in mentoring and I think that is the key of lowering the amount of bullying that happens in our schools on a mm -hmm. daily basis that's right and one last thing I want to preface too I don't think that there's a principal in this district that at some point in their career they've not had to recommend for the mother to maybe get some support for domestic abuse or the YWCA um, because sometimes there's also another bully in the home and so it's really about working with that family and finding out what are some supports that our district can recommend for you and a lot of that's coming out with our community counseling thank you so much all right thank you all for coming and doing presentation tonight and I think Mr. Evans had thank you words. thank you thank you President America as we uh, draw a close to that just a, a couple of comments one of the things we started off the school year with was Dr. Mark Adler and his wife Joni sharing a bullying story through social media that ended up in a, a, a horrific tragedy the loss of their son through suicide and 
they share the story to help highlight the same things I just heard our board members talk about, that young people are impacted by how they're treated. And, and these devices make a difference in their lives in middle school and high school. So we are keenly aware that we need to keep working on that. We need to develop more mentoring programs. We need to be more cognizant of creating a, a safety zone in our schools where students are willing to go to their teacher, their principal, their counselor, whoever it might be, and certainly their parents at home, and share when they're feeling that someone's doing something that's threatening to them, inappropriate to them. They need to be able to share that, and I think that's part of it, too, is creating that climate and environment where they're willing to share. Thank you. All right. Next up is our presentation on NISA and the first year of the everyone in the state, every junior in the state of Nebraska taking the ACT. Um, and I know this is something that's been long coming because the state just officially re released the results from last year on Friday. Correct? Yes. Um, so I'll turn it over to Mr. Shambani. Madam President, I think, I think I'll start out with some opening comments. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about more than just the ACT. We're also going to talk about NISA. We're going to share with you some of the changes that, as you know, we've got first-year baseline data for the ELA where English language arts uh, assessment has been changed. We're in the last year of mathematics, and we're going to go through some highlights of what we've seen in that trend data before they change to a new tool there. So you're going to hear descriptions on what the new tools are how they're being administered. You're going to hear some information about the results and some of the information about what we as a district, how we're responding and reacting. And um, hopefully you'll sense some of, the, some of the sense of urgency that we have on this work and certainly that I have as well. And uh, I know uh, we've heard some speakers tonight on ACT and, and we recognize there's work to be done. And anyone who would suggest otherwise uh, hasn't looked at all the data. We also recognize in some areas we've shown great growth and we'll talk about that too and in some of the particular schools where we've applied specific uh, resources we've seen results but but we certainly have not hit the mark everywhere and uh, that's our responsibility and certainly my responsibility so I think tonight's an opportunity to share where we are and where we need to go and, and accept some responsibility for some of that along the way. But at first, let's kind of walk through some of the changes that the state of Nebraska has made this year. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, if you look at the change, this was an active year in assessments, both in changes to the actual assessments themselves, as well as some significant standards change. As you know, uh, state statute recently was changed uh, with legislative uh, passage of a college and career expectation for alignment to standard uh, to increase student outcomes based on preparation for college, career, and life, as our, our district vision statement would read. Um, so there were a number of changes. Looking at English language arts first, uh, as was mentioned, this is a baseline year. Uh, we had standards change the year before last. Uh, the test itself changed last year. And we'll talk about that standard process here in a moment. So 1617 was a new year of a new test. And this test is really, in many ways, not comparable to the reading test that came before it in so many ways, uh, both in the depth of knowledge required, as well as the types of items that it uh, considers. It is, a, in many ways, a com combination of assessments, English reading and writing, uh, which is very different. Um, basically, the state's guidance, uh, which you have two talking points documents, one's for the ACT, one for NISA, kind of contemplate some of these changes and the reality that it is very much a different test. You would have had to score nearly proficiently on the previous reading test to have a hope of, uh, or nearly advanced, I should say, uh, to have a hope of finding proficiency on the ELA test. So it is a, a new test that is much more rigorous, as we'll see with other college and career aligned assessments. Um, this is the last year, actually this is the first year of the new maths test. Uh, with the uh, standards changing last year. Um, so we had standards change last year in mathematics. This year will be the new assessment. Uh, that is aligned then to those college and career readiness standards. Uh, additionally, as was mentioned, this is the baseline year for ACT, uh, which significantly expanded access to a premier college entrance exam. Um, and so we have some new data uh, to work with to identify opportunities for growth. And one thing I should mention as we talk about those standards, that does create somewhat of a challenge, and the state certainly recognizes this. You have your standards change the year prior to the assessment changing. And so teachers will be receiving new standards 
um, while they're still uh, preparing students for a test on the old standards. Uh, that does create a challenge for teachers, especially as we move towards these new college and career readiness standards, which, as I said, are much more rigorous um, and difficult. And so uh, for teachers really to get a grasp around teaching to a new standard, they have to first understand and recognize that standard and the indicators associated with it. As far as measurement, uh, many of you know this, but just as a summary, uh, we assess students using the NISA, which is a summative assessment or a criterion reference assessment, the criterion being those state standards. Um, we assess NISA English Language Arts in grades three through eight using the NISA assessment. Uh, NISA, NISA Mathematics is three through eight as well. NISA Science is only at two grades, those being five and eight. Uh, the NISA alternative assessment for those students whose disability status makes a non-alternative assessment uh, not possible for them. Take the alternative assessment in 3 through 8 plus 11. This is in uh, contrast to the ACT. These students are still taking the NISA alt assessment um, that we generally don't see many more than 1% of students taking that alt assessment. Um, looking at ACT, as you know, uh, this is a grade 11 assessment now. Um, we typically are used to the national results or typically the results of seniors. This is for 11th graders or 2018 graduates. So moving first to English language arts. As I said, this is a, a new test in, in many ways, shapes, and form based on those college and career readiness standards which are much more rigorous. Um, that increased rigor, relevance, and high expectations for all students are, are well documented by the state as well as in the data that we see. These changes in proficiency levels um, also came along with this change, and that includes different proficiency expectations at every grade level. We're used to having kind of one standard, if you will, on NISA, and now it is a bit different for each grade level. We also um, see a different um, way of referring to those standards. We're used to kind of the beginning proficient and advanced. They're now a numerical based um, process where three is beginning, two is proficient, and one is advanced. So I wanted to bring that up. And as was said, 2016-17 provides baseline data on this assessment. Looking at the results of this new assessment in its first year, we find that the district elementary average for proficiency, uh, that is those students who are both proficient or advanced, is 39.4. You have the grade results shown here where it says district, that's the elementary average. The middle school average is 32.3%. Looking at the gap with the state, which does give us an opportunity to see where we are situated in this new content and these new standards relative to our peers. We find an average gap. Here you see the, the state gaps with just below 15% being kind of the low mark with nearly 20% being the high mark, the average being about 16%. This is similar to where we started with the reading assessment a number of years ago in its baseline year. Uh, it should be noted that that was a significantly rigorous test. So there is some good news to be had here that we are already starting as close as we were on a less rigorous test, suggesting that our students are getting both breadth and depth already that we can now build upon to increase these scores in subsequent years. I'm going to be joined by a colleague, um, Chief Academic Officer, Melissa Comine. Thank you. Some of the current efforts that we have going on for our ELA are listed as bullets. Obviously, these are not the only research-based strategies or evidence-based strategies that we use, but these are some of the highlighted ones for this school year. And you'll see that there are some listed for elementary as well as secondary. And really what happens is when you have a research-based strategy, you obviously provide professional development from the district level as well as at the school level, and you put these strategies in your school improvement plan so they're constantly embedded in everything that you do. But what's most important is is that these strategies turn into look fors. And what those look fors are is our instructional leaders, which include our principals, assistant principals, SSLs, instructional facilitators, literacy facilitators, math coaches, and so forth, and also district staff, that we have to get into classrooms. We have to get into classrooms and have frequent um, observations, quick observations in the form of coaching and then face-to-face -face conversations with teachers. And the reasons that we have to get into the classrooms is because one, we have to see if teachers are using the right strategies, but two, are those teachers utilizing them effectively. You can have a teacher who says, I've done this, this, and this, and this is what I've been asked to do, but if they're not doing it effectively, we're not going to have any results. And so it, um, administrators and instructional leaders first have to be able to identify and collect 
all of the different instructional strategies being used and are they doing uh, are the teachers doing them well and are students actually learning from them and then from that data collection that's when we need to make some decisions um, as far as what we do next and sometimes that's a decision that's district-wide and sometimes it's for individual schools or individual levels whether it's at the elementary middle and high school um, so again these are just a, a plethora of some of the high yield strategies that we're currently working on in the area of English language arts of course with the new college and career readiness standards they are quite rigorous that's one of the things that um, I think we have to we're gonna have to have a unified effort and a team effort and making sure that we're working with our teachers students and families to ensure that we can meet those um, it's those are expectations we have and those are expectations we're going to have to meet and we take those very seriously okay now talk about nisa mathematics so as a reminder this year we will have a new assessment over the new standards college and career line standards that were introduced last year much as we found with ELA, this new assessment will have increased rigor, um, will be more relevant to students and tied to real world examples, and will create a need and a greater urgency for having those high expectations for students and exposing them to the most rigorous coursework. Um, additionally, we'll see changes in proficiency levels. Those changes will come out as uh, standard setting and other things are done to create uh, where the cutoff should be and we'll provide those as they become available. 2017-18 um, will provide a new baseline year. Uh, the results we'll talk about today, just to, to remind, is a 16-17 assessment, which is the old assessment aligned to the old standards. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, uh, the last year when I presented on this topic, there was a question about why do we see such a pronounced drop going to middle school. I wanted to, to readdress that with some most uh, more relevant research that I've been able to find. Uh, one thing that should be noted is that as we move towards higher grade levels, especially as we make that leap into middle school and high school, the tests become more of a, a census test, if you will, not looking at granular skills as we do at lower levels, like number sense, addition, which uh, addition being a component of an algebra class or statistics or things of that nature, which are the very things that are assessed then at those greater grades. We look at algebra comprehension, geomet geometry, and statistics. So you see the scale kind of gets larger as you move up in grade. And so that is something I wanted to mention. As we look at the results across what here is a six-year trend, um, we see that the district has, comparing to baseline, um, outperformed baseline and maintained that in all grades but fifth and sixth. Let me just add a few points to this. I, I think, and I've talked to some community members, staff, and others, um, this is probably the most impactful to me in that this is not substantial growth. It isn't. And, and that's my concern is it's actually a bigger issue to me than a new baseline year for ACT because this is six years of data. And I really only see two grade levels as I talk to community staff that we can feel good that the growth has been somewhat significant grade 8 with a total of uh, plus 7 grade uh, grade 4 with a plus 5 and then we see marginal growth and in fact a slight dip at grade 5 this kept me up most of the weekend because I, I be quite honest with you in my career I've never been in a leadership role whether it was a principal, deputy soup, superintendent, where I haven't seen consistent growth. And I actually thought last year, if you look at the charts, you saw kind of an upward trend, and I thought, I think we're going to get there. And I thought we'd see that last year um, build on the growth, which would have made it significant and would have made it something that we could have said, we are headed the right direction and felt good about it. I don't feel good about this. I can't we are going to do some soul searching I've already uh, asked Ms. Comine I've met with a lot of staff I started meeting with staff and having phone calls on Friday we need a task force we need a, a serious relook at the work we're doing because to do the same thing we've been doing when the result didn't get us where we need to be which isn't to say we don't see some grade levels that show some growth but for a six-year trend chart to not show more growth is unacceptable it's unacceptable to me and, and I feel 
personally upset about it. And I know staff does too. We had a, an exercise that I walked them through how they felt when they looked at this data and we had index cards and everyone filled out and everybody kind of said the same thing I say. It's difficult, it's discouraging, it's concerning, it's unacceptable. And so the attitude is right and now it's taken that attitude to action and that action is going to mean more than one thing. It's going to mean classroom observation time because at the end of the day the classroom experience is what has the biggest impact on this. And so it's not just us understanding good strategies and understanding how to have how to have engaged classrooms. It's making sure that in 65 elementary schools and middle schools and high schools we're creating that environment. And we clearly haven't done that. I, I mean I'm not I'm not willing to say we've done that when I can only show two of these grade levels with what I'd call enough growth to feel confident that it's going the right direction and then to have the other grade levels not demonstrating that when you when you look at those numbers so it's the first time in my career that I've seen something like this and by the way we don't have this with language arts it's a consistent upward trend and I think we're moving the right direction there we have struggled with this and we struggled with it three years ago I had some pretty lengthy conversations but we're not there and we owe our students more than this most importantly but we owe the school board more than this and please anticipate that you're going to hear highlights of where we're going in the future uh, this isn't something that we can hand off to someone else in seven months and say we're happy with these results I'm not we're not it's unacceptable and we know that and we kn I know that you as a board want to have more than two grade levels showing significant growth and so we have work to do here that 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 it needs to look like the stair step that language arts looks like that to me is one of our biggest issues as we look at how we support our schools and classrooms and we're going to show some other data here in a minute where we've done some significant changes in some schools and the results look differently but as a big picture this big picture is unacceptable so I want to just to stop and highlight that and promise the board that you're going to see more information coming back so with that I'll let you move forward and so just like Mr. Evans said, um, my team and the other district departments are in agreement that we have created a sense of urgency around mathematics. We did see an upward trend in ELA. Uh, we did not see the same upward trend in the area of mathematics. Um, and so even though we're still highlighting and pinpointing what we need to do better in ELA, we're gonna have to have an either, even greater sense of urgency in the area of math. We're going to have to create a math task force. We're going to have to look at internally, externally, bring people in from schools. And we're going to have to figure out what are some things that we're doing really well, what are some things we should be doing well that we aren't doing well, as well as what are some things we need to start doing. Um, I am confident that this is going to be a team effort. As soon as the results were sent out Wednesday night, we had a Thursday morning meeting um, with Mr. Evans and some of my colleagues, and then we had a Friday morning meeting. We had a lot of communication over the weekend and then also a larger meeting this morning that included the executive directors, um, leadership from CIS, we had research there, um, we had human resources there, um, and a few other people because this truly is going to need to be a team effort. It is not going to rest on one person's shoulders. We are all going to have to roll our sleeves up. We're all going to have to do whatever we need to do to make sure that we support our teachers so they can support our kids because at the end of the day, it's our kids that matter. Um, and so we do have work that we will be doing. Um, I'm very um, confident we have a great staff who is dedicated um, and they will um, be here like they've always been here and we will make sure that um, if we have to take things off of their plates so they can focus in on specific things in their job to do to have a better focus to have a better um, input and output then that's what we'll do um, but I am very confident in our staff that they will come together and make this happen for us okay now shifting to science uh, the new standards for the new science assessment are a little ways off. We'll be seeing those in 2021 um, with a new assessment to come. The science standards moving to a 3D science standard, um, which I won't go into too much detail on, but it does require a level of coordination across a number of different areas of science that, that will be a, a truly challenging and wonderful opportunity for students. 
Um, one thing, or a couple things to mention relative to science, this is an assessment only given at fifth and eighth grade, um, so there are very limited numbers of students who take this test, therefore it's uh, much more able to be affected by what's called a sample effect, which is just differences in, in classes that are moving through the system. So we look for a more general trend across a number of years instead of being uh, too distracted by blips, though we do pay attention to what happened in those years and to see if uh, performance for students was different. Looking across the sweep of time and the comparison to our baseline year, we do see that we have made significant growth since the baseline year with 9% at 5th grade and 5% at 8th grade um, with a slight setback in the last year going from 15-16 to 16-17. Um, though it is also a trend uh, that we've seen at 5th grade where we've kind of had some years of stability um, but look to increase and to continue building upon that baseline result. I'll turn our focus to some of those um, opportunities that Mr. Evans had mentioned. Well, we wanted to highlight some of the significant efforts that the school board has supported over the last two to three years has been our REACH schools. Those are those schools that were identified by the state of Nebraska as persistent low achieving schools. And specifically, we ask for support for resources, for training, for for how we worked with those individual scores, schools that are predominantly in North Omaha. Now, the good news is what we see in these results is that when we focus our energy and efforts, we got great, great results. So I showed you those district-wide results specifically in math and shared some of my discontent. But I will tell you, I can't say anything but good things about the staff, the kids, the community that have wrapped their rounds around two of our REACH schools, for example. Uh, when you look at these double-digit gains, for Druid Hill, and that was on top of gains from last year as well, and Kennedy also gaining. Those are two great examples of schools that we've really worked hard and diligently and applied a team effort with good leadership, and the results are incredible. Now, if you want to look a little bit bigger at the trends for those REACH schools across the board, we put some charts together to show you that two out of three are showing improvement on the three-year math trend. Two out of three are showing improvement on the science trend for three years. Uh, the, the reading trend is, is up and positive for every single one of them. So we see three-year trend data that says when we focus our energy and effort in an aligned fashion, we can make a difference, which is why I don't accept that we can't have the whole picture looking different for the entire district. So it's not our REACH schools and our persistent low achieving schools that are impacting that data because here you'll see, here you'll see evidence of uh, growth that we can feel very good about. So the aggregate of all tests you'll see also on the last page there, uh, nearly 8 out of 10 showing three-year three -year growth uh, on all the aggregated tests. So we're moving the needle there in schools that, by the way, we can show you they weren't moving the needle before. We've got evidence that there was no gains. So on one hand, we did a really good thing for a select group of schools. But on the other hand, for the big picture, we were not able to consistently move district-wide the math scores. We had two grade levels where we had 7% and 5% growth over a six-year period, which I'm okay with. That shows consistent. But then the other showing flat line. So we're doing some things right. We just have to apply that at a bigger scale so that we see the same kind of results we're seeing with our REACH schools, those most challenging schools, if we can have success there, then why in the world would we not be able to have success in every one of our schools? So I'll stop at that, but I, I didn't sleep much this weekend thinking about it because it's just, it was, it was a surprise to me. I did not expect the trend chart to look quite like it did. So I'll stop at that and go ahead, Scott. Just to wrap up, NISA prior to shifting to ACT to bring a couple more changes, there are more, uh, that are coming this year. There is a new name. Um, it is now, and surely this came from a committee, Nebraska Student Centered Assessment System, or NSCUS. Um, so no more NISA, it's now NSCUS. Um, NWEA, who also provides our MAP um, interim assessment that we utilize at three different time points throughout the year to check where skill, uh, students are on skill development. Um, NWEA will be the new vendor for the state test this year, so we're looking forward to that opportunity. Um, additionally, NSCUS Mathematics will transition, as I've said, to those new college and career readiness assessments. And I think it would make sense if we kind of paused and did questions 
and discussion related to NISA specifically, then do the ACT. Um, so if board members have any questions, discussion regarding the NISA results. Mrs. Gotti. Well, I shared with Mr. Evans, um, this is probably some of the most discouraging news I've seen since I started on the board. And um, I had a pretty emotional weekend too. Um, I was teary-eyed during it as well when I read through the information. Um, I ran for this board specifically to um, help bring math scores up and specifically recognizing that our African-American male eighth grade math scores for sure five years ago were 50, 49th in the nation. I'm guessing we probably haven't moved too far and that's pretty discouraging knowing that you've worked really, really hard. And, you know, when I go back to slide 10 and I, um, I know that there has been some growth, but when I really look at it and I look at the time that I've sat on this board from 13, 14, um, we're really flat. We really haven't, we really haven't done anything since we started. Um, you know, there's been a little bit of movement, like you said, in math. Um, at the eighth grade level, but it just hasn't been where I thought it would be. It's pretty discouraging. Um, so I guess I, ha I will ask a few questions here. In the ELA, when we say we're seeing trends up, when I look on the chart that has the data by school, is the little tiny up arrow an indica indicator that that particular school moved ahead from where they're reading writing score was in the previous year or how did you determine since this was a baseline which schools were really moving up and that's uh, based on the district average so above we'll get them a, a carrot indication okay okay so it's because it's baseline it's not really we don't really know where we're at correct on o this. the only way we know anything of where we're at. So the test has changed, so you have to find the thing that's remained common, and right. that generally is our, our performance relative to the state and all those other districts. So okay. That's why we looked at the gaps, but even that's um, somewhat difficult to compare. Right, okay. So I just wanted to understand that. So I guess um, when I look at page two, and thank you very much, because I always appreciate it when you give us the um, the further detail. Um, is there any way, and I know I've been to a session at the state with their um, data guru. Is there any way when we talk about at the bottom of the page in that paragraph, um, the same students, that cohort group, do we have data on how cohort groups are trending and, and how those, how that particular student is trending? I mean, do we know Okay, so last year they were in math, but now this group of math students has done better. And then, you know, refining that and going further in and saying, wow, what's happening in this particular environment that allowed this cohort to go up and this cohort stayed the same or went down? Sure. So in, in the general trend, you can look across it. We don't have that. I don't have it available to me now, that but I can certainly yeah. provide that and I'll provide it to Mr. Ray. What I would suggest, though, is a more, while it doesn't cover the sweep of time per se, um, and certainly changes to assessments will impact what we see that cohort do, so just marking when those occurred so you can have that understanding. Really, as we look to growth of students and students' performance over time, that's one of the reasons we're very excited with the MAP assessment, giving it three times a year. It goes outside of grade level, goes all the way down to the instructional level. Um, so for a long perspective, we'd have to use this proficiency or summative level data, uh, but we would look in the future to be able to provide much more information relative to growth within a school year and there beyond, uh, given that we're now K-10 in MAP. So right. as the oh, years progress, great. that'll be exciting data. And that was actually one of my questions. Um, we have not gotten the map data for last year, right? And so when will we see the map data? Sure. And just to be clear, last year we expanded to the REACH schools. So the REACH right. had the first year and some opportunity. Some of them had two years, just depending if they were part of a special program. Uh, this year we're assessing with MAP and would have a full district look. Right. Um, 
we would have some growth information as early as mid-year talking about um, going from fall to winter um, and then we would have a full sweep of the full year come oh, probably around June uh, May is the last assessment for the year so I would love to have us have a presentation on that maybe after the first of the year just to kind of get a sense on that um, just in kind of looking back over my notes one of the things I um, I want to thank Mr. Evans for because I think I worked on this for um, probably 10 to 11 years was the fact that we never offered writing curriculum at the elementary level for probably two decades and I have since I've had my oldest who's now almost ready to finish college was a second grader I have been very frustrated with that and I want to thank Mr. Evans for last year um, listening to my frustration um, for the umpteenth time and talking to the EDs and getting to the place where we're actually offering writing curriculum. I think the sad part of that is that NISA didn't offer the writing test. So when you talk about going into the classroom and understanding, what I want to know is that we now have the curriculum. Are we actually using it? Because we no longer have to worry about NISA writing. And so that's always my um, concern on that component of yes. it. Yeah, and yes. it, it, that's what we have to do. We have to make sure we're actually using it. Yes, so. and as a former principal, I recall not having that resource and desperately wanted one for years. Yes. And yep. so, yes, we do have one, yep. and we are still continuing to use it. Yep. And I, I appreciate that because, I, I, to me, that was one of the most critical components that was missing in my child's education, and so I'm thankful for that. Um, I just want to reflect back on... Some of the things that we've talked about, and I'll um, save some of it for when we talk about the ACT, but um, <clears throat> I know that Mrs. Comine and I, before I even came on to the board, had a great conversation about departmentalized teaching. I had the opportunity to have two of my kids in fourth grade in departmentalized math. Um, one child was not in departmentalized math. Whether there's research or not, um, I think we have to think outside the box on those types of implementations of whatever the methodology is because I saw students who were um, departmentalized at an average level go on to high school to be in AP classes and be very successful and now we're in college as engineers where um, had they not had that opportunity I'm not so sure they would have had some of those successes had they not gotten the foundational work done at that level. So I guess I, I ask for us to really be open-minded in our classrooms and in our buildings when we look at those types of things. I would also bring back up, and I know Mr. Evans and I have talked about this before, um, we know that we don't have the resources, nor will we probably, unless all of a sudden the state has amazing um, economic growth in um, agriculture. <laughs> we're not going to see lots of extra money to be able to provide for pre-k um, type of efforts and I would just ask that we really really think about especially in schools where there is where there's a struggle in academic success that we're really looking at transition rooms so you go to kindergarten and you didn't quite master everything then you go to K1 and then the next year you're in first grade because there's a student in our building. We would have um, state funding for that. Um, other school districts do that. It's probably more of a charter philosophy too, but I would like to see us really make sure that we're catching those kiddos on the bottom end where they can gain the confidence that they need. And um, I think back to my own life. I was a student that was held back in third grade, um, but then after the first quarter, the teacher said, oh, wow, you're doing so well. You should go to fourth grade. And then all of a sudden, I was getting Fs and Ds and everything. And then they said, wow, you're not doing very well. Let's go back to third grade. And so I got to do third and fourth grade like multiple times, I feel like. But at the end of the day, having the opportunity to really gain success, I went to school as a four-year-old with a mom who had two little kids. My mom didn't speak English until she went to kindergarten. She had no idea that it was important to even read to me or do those kinds of things. So I guess 
I just think about the parents that we have in our district and what can we do to think outside of the box and be really thoughtful in creating, maybe not, maybe it, has, it doesn't have the most research on it, but maybe we should be doing it. Um, and then I guess the last, the last thing I want to talk about, and I know, um, Scott, you and I have had many conversations about the departmentalized approach, really digging into that data and understanding how we can help kids in math. Um, one of the things that I just want to mention is that it was nine years ago that I met with curriculum staff and said, hey, you know what, we're not doing geometry well at the eighth grade level. We are taking our best and our brightest kids, but we're not giving them honors geometry. We're giving them basic geometry, and then we're asking them to answer 16 questions on an ACT test their junior year. And so I would just ask that we rethink how we do those seventh and eighth grade math classes and that we ensure we're actually meeting the needs of the student because th this has been really depressing information to read this weekend and I read through it all I went back to some of my old data and it, it's just disappointing and I know Mr. Evans feels the same way I do you put a whole lot of time in and we just didn't get where we wanted to get to so I also recognize their schools that did really really well and um, I'm very very appreciative of that so it's not all schools but we're not where we should be, so thank you, and I'm, I'll stop uh, my commentary for now, but I feel like I've been on this path for a decade, and I'm really discouraged by it. Okay, Mr. Scanlon. A couple of questions. Um, I've sat up here a couple of years and listened to the NISA um, results and everything, and it seems like every year I hear that you know, such and such year is a new baseline year. The assessments change, the, you know, we're based on new, I, who continues to change those requirements of what the standards and assessments are based on? Sure, that would be the state. Nebraska Department of Education uh, will adjust standards. Many of us learn to read second grade sometimes first now it's moved down to kindergarten so you can see the progress of those standards shifting those skills to earlier and earlier grades but NDE is the one who uh, makes those decisions so they involve Nebraska educators whenever possible how, how long do they usually leave them in place before they start to change them seven years uh, is the development process and cycle so are we just in like the last couple of years we're in the uh, time period where seven years ago they started to look at everything and change everything it's that as well as the statute passed to move to college and career readiness standards so it's kind of that dual emphasis it's part of a regular cycle as well as being influenced by legislative mandates so the college and career piece kind of got worked into that as well okay so it's been kind of a moving target is that correct for some time yeah okay. as, as standards are shifted and expectations are raised um well and even with that said um you know, I'm very disappointed in the results that we've got, much like everybody has said. Uh, do we have an ELA uh, graph that shows the six-year um, history? I, I didn't see that in, in here. Is there? ELA uh, is a brand new this year, so you have the reading tests, but they're very different. Um, the guidance from the state is n not to treat them comparable in any way, shape, or form. So we have uh, in that table, if you look far to the right, we have the last three years of reading results by school, um, but it isn't presented anywhere in the PowerPoint. You don't want to confuse things with the new assessment. Okay, so if I'm looking at this correct, then uh, slide five, um, that is this year's um, proficiency and advanced for uh, ELA results. Correct. Okay. By grade. I guess my biggest concern is in looking at this, um, you know, we're, from what I could tell, we were happy with some of the progress we've made with ELA, but yet everybody's under 50% proficient or advanced. Am I reading that correctly? No, you, if you want to look at progress, it'd be the far well, right. No, I'm just talking about percentage oh. proficient. 
Yeah, where we're starting with ELA in this baseline year, you're Am I? right. That's a uh, that column there. Um, right. I'm the looking graphics. at this one. Oh, okay. Is that? Am I? Am I looking at that correctly? Is that Correct. saying that only? I mean, fourth grade is the closest to 45 percent proficient and advanced. Correct. So. I mean, I mean, that's pretty bad. It, it's a pretty low start. We started out out that low in reading when we began, and we showed <laughs> progression and uh, consistent growth. As I said before, you have to be cautious because when we look at the standard to just meet basic proficiency, you would not be proficient on this new test, um, having been proficient before, unless you were scoring almost advance on the reading test. Um, well, I guess. The math result or the math hasn't changed, right? Not well. The standards changed last year, and the test will change this year. I mean, we're st we're still looking at you know sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Everybody's pretty close to fifty percent or less. I mean, these these just they're they're horrible results when you look at how many you know we've we've got only we've got a third grade that's sixty two percent proficient. Fourth grade, 60. Fifth grade, 60, and then it drops off to 51 percent. I mean, we're talking about half of our students. Uh, I, I just, I don't, I understand why people are in the crowd concerned. I mean, and then you go to the science and, you know, it's, again, 55 is our high in, in the fifth grade. I, I guess we're talking about you know not being happy with it and we're talking about task force and everything but what's the task force going to do what do we what do we really need to do to accomplish and and i commend the the reach schools for finally focusing on them and getting them the resources that they need i know we have a lot of high uh high poverty in our district but i mean you could probably ask Bo Pelini and Mike Riley what <laughs> less than 500 gets you in this state. I just, it, it's just concerning that, you know, we're talking about trying to make progress, but we're not even making progress over 50% in a lot of this. And I'd, I'd really like to, I know, Superintendent, you're talking about um, not being happy with these, but we've got, uh, and you, you pointed out some things that, you'd like to see happen um, you're you're retiring in in June how do we as a district make sure that we make progress and move that on into the next uh, superintendent uh, I guess phase era a couple of comments first on the reading before the new assessment that happened this year we did have double digit gains over a five year time span and that's why I look at those results and say that the work we were doing there was making a difference I recognize what you're saying on this first year of the baseline but what I'd be looking for if I was sitting at the board was where is this next year and you should expect growth you had growth for five years on language arts up to that so I, I still would contend our schools our teachers our kids they showed tremendous growth and we have double digit growth what we don't see is in the math. I mean, you're right on on that. And, and I'm, I'm as disappointed and upset and concerned, and so your question is a good one. How do we make sure we get these pieces in place before we hand the baton off so that we make sure we're moving, moving that needle in the right direction like we did when we focused the resources on those 10 or 11 schools in North Omaha that now are having success, that weren't having success, and we've got Eight out, eight out of ten of them moving the needle we have to do that same level of support that same level of focus and we need to work together to do that I, I don't think it's going to be one person in one thing because when you look at Druid Hill and Kennedy for example showing those significant gains that wasn't one thing it was a multiplicity of things but it was extra resources too and so we've got to figure out how to focus resources at the school level with the leadership of the district as well as the leadership in the school and we need to get that moving this spring in mathematics particularly 
so that we can see those same results. Uh, we need to be reporting back to you on a regular basis on here's, where we, here's what we've done, here's what we're thinking, here's what we're moving forward with. Um, and I've, I've tasked the staff and the district level that same thing. I, I think they've heard my sense of urgency over the last few meetings. I see a few heads shaking. It was a pretty sincere, straightforward message of which I can be. I know, Mr. Scanlon, you're very straightforward. Uh, I can be straightforward as well. And I'm as disappointed in this as you are, particularly the math because that's a trend data and I always look at trend data lines and if you can't show growth over time well I'll tell you I told some staff I said you know would it have been any different if none of us would have been here would it have been the same I mean that's a question would it have been the same because you've got two grade levels with no growth at all you've got two that had growth that was five and seven percent not too bad and then you've got a couple that went down one of them went down one percent that's not appropriate. It's not appropriate to our kids. It tells us that all of us, all of us, including me, failed. All of us, including me. And that's what I told staff. But that being said, so what are you going to do about it? Which is where we're at now, and we need to be accountable to you and come back to you with some of the changes that we're going to expect to see and some of the resources, some of the focus that needs to be there. I have a principal's meeting uh, this week. And they're going to hear some of the same conversation about how we can help them more because their success at the REACH schools was because we assisted and supported and helped develop them. And there were some other changes too, depending on the site. I could give you a whole a litany of things that happened. We're going to have to attack the math issue with a whole litany of things as well. So your deserved anxiety uh, is appropriate and you need to continue while I'm here and whoever isn't is in this chair when I'm not to say where are we going show me the trend data data show me that it's going the right direction we've shown you that in some areas here in the last five years but we clearly have not in math and it's a shock to me it's I told the staff it's the first time in my career it's happened where I couldn't say that we showed growth and I, I never expect double-digit growth every year because sometimes when I see double-digit growth every year I've seen that happen in school districts like Atlanta and people ended up in jail because it's just not really feasible unless you're probably playing with the numbers um, so I don't expect that but I expect growth and I expect to look at a trend chart over six years and it says our young people know more about math today than they did five years ago and when I've got two grade levels that I can say they don't necessarily we failed and I say we me not not you as a board that was my job and so I, I don't say that with um, I, well I just I just feel um, that I didn't do my job and I apologize for that mr. snow thank you madam president um, I echo the comments from mr. Scanlon and miss Godding um, I have a question and, and mr. Evans thank you for your uh, open comments um, uh, and admitting uh, the struggles that we have in the district uh, and sense of where we need to go uh, to correct the math scores uh, uh, increase them um, I have a quick question well several questions the, the first one is it might be directed more at miss Comine it's the current efforts and this goes with mathematics as well as all these. I mean, how do we evaluate? And this is something, how do, are these new programs? Are these new consultants, organizations that we're working with? Or are these people that we have organizations with the same things we've been doing years prior? So the, with the district strategic plan, they created a five-year math comprehensive plan. And we can get you a copy of that. And part of that plan was and I'm going to go off of your question here real quick to give you a little bit of background. Part of that plan was to create some OPS math curriculum guides, which were created this year. Um, part of the plan was to develop some math look-fors and OPS numeracy strategies and also do some focus on coaching. Some of that was to ensure that the entire instructional time is being used to its best 
um, effect. Um, some of that time was implementing kindergarten through sixth grade, 50 to 60 minutes whole group every day, and then 15 to 25 minutes of differentiated groups. And then middle school um, grade six on up is 90 minutes. And then also at the high school trying to get 60 minutes daily in all secondary grade levels. And as far as those time allotments go, there's been progress made um, in elementaries have made progress middle schools are making some good progress and we still have some progress to make in our high schools um, and then also a part of that plan was implement the 242 distributed practice and then also taking a look at a co-teaching model you had mentioned some of the consultants some of the um, one of the elementary consultants has been with us when go math was first adopted that was one of the consultants that came in with the instructional resource and then the middle schoolers and secondary um, consultant was there last year and is back this year as well how do you evaluate the consultants and the different efforts that you're doing to increase so we actually are engaging in conversations with that right now um, mrs christopherson who is our director of secondary education had that very conversation with the math supervisor about a week or two ago and taking a look at is one are they doing the right things and two are we getting um, are we having an effect on student achievement around that i think it's good to have consultants but we just can't have a consultant go in and expect it to happen i think we're going to have to have a more wraparound approach thank you uh, the, looking at the statistics and the numbers i mean these students are our students so they're not going away uh, they're going to be at school every day and they're going to show up into the next grade so how do we make sure that the students are mastering these levels before moving to the next grade level so there's a lot of different things first we have to get great teaching going on in all of our classrooms and we have to have checks for understanding every day teachers need to know that where their students are not just at the end of the lesson but throughout the lesson to help inform instruction we also need to um, research and CIS we've taken we have um, started to engage in some conversations around what are some of those formative assessments and maybe what are some of those common common assessments and we have common assessments when they're with our instructional resources but what other types of um, formative assessments can we embed one of the things that I continue to talk about is is, um, back when I was a teacher um, I remember being a first-year teacher and teaching that the textbook in math from page one all the way to the end well that's not the way you teach math there's no way you can teach math that way and so first we have to help our teachers understand their standards our curriculum guides are helping with that but one of the things that I vividly re remember and it was part of an old assessment system by the state and I'm not suggesting we create these CRTs but my mere point of saying this is those CRTs really helped me learn my standards and also to the level of difficulty that my students needed to master each standard and then I could do what I called a backwards map and design my math instruction and then every day on a daily basis or every other day I could put in some quick quizzes and quick assessments so I think we're going to have to really be creative with some schedulings with some times with instructional strategies thinking outside of the box but also some of those formative assessments to measure our students along the way and we're going to have to have a team of people that our schools are going to have to monitor it and we're going to have a team of people at the district office that are going to help our schools monitor it and come back that says here was our goal these are our measures and this is how we're doing do you believe in holding a student back until they master that grade level before they move on to the next grade so my ex so I'll answer that in two parts um, when you take a look at research it doesn't support retention if you look at look if you look at Haiti's research he has a variety of strategies and there are eight that actually have a negative impact on achievement that is one of them however as a, a principal um, there were times where I retained a student or re was retention and that decision is always uh, a lengthy decision it's a personal decision for that individual child it's a decision where a multitude of meetings occur over the course of at least a semester where parents are involved staff are involved um, there are times where it's not appropriate to retain and there were some times where we thought it was appropriate to retain a child thank you I have a uh two more questions or comments 
Um, that I know when I got on the school board uh, originally, I mean, I talked about having another focus school in Omaha, uh, like Wilson Focus School. How do we take some of the successes we've had, like the REACH schools, and apply them at some of the schools that we have that are struggling? How do we take the successes? And I'm looking at Wilson Focus School, and they, they went down a little bit, but how do we take some of the unique challenges, uh, the unique ways that we have developed education in the district from different schools that is successful and apply that at our most uh, challenging, uh, schools with the most challenges? Mm -hmm. um, how do we do that or do we and the reason why I bring this up is I see these reach schools successful uh, Howard Kennedy uh, as well as um, Druid Hill but how do we imitate those and continue those successes um, I usually see the district create a great program and they don't you know make copies of it It just becomes a great program in itself and it doesn't get spread across the district so as just as a board member how are we going to do things differently this time than we have done in the past so I think that's a, a great question when you take a look at our reach schools like Druid Hill for example we worked on building capacity of the principal and the leadership team that's where we started and um, then we so we had the executive directors that were involved and in working with the principals um, and I'll go back to my time as an executive director working with the principal their leadership team we did have an outside consultant that was a good match um, for some of the buildings as well and built that leadership team first so that leadership team can then build the capacity of teachers that work was very intense and it was very frequent we also um, utilize curriculum instruction support they provided literacy facilitators some math coaches um, SSLs we also had some social workers so we put a lot of additional people in support as well um, what we did has made a difference um, we need to continue to make a difference it it costs money um, to have people and to put those extra resources in there but I think the first thing is taking a look at the resources we have and replicating that and that, that goes, you've answered the question the way I thought you would, is how do we look at the things that we're currently doing that we are saying that are successes, evaluate them, and if they're not effective, uh, find a different way to use that resource, that monetary resource, to really uh, continue the successes that we have at these additional schools so we can spread it at all the schools in Omaha Public Schools. Um, I understand we have more poverty than all the school districts that, you know, on the social media that people were listing. Um, however, that's no excuse for the uh, results that we received. And I know we can do better. Um, and I challenge you guys to not just come back with an update of what you're doing, um, but to be more aggressive in the rigor and how we can make sure before that student moves to the next grade level that they can master that current grade level because if not they're going to move to the next grade level and when that test result comes in it's going to be the same i you, agree you we'll can't master something if you continue moving and we'll definitely you know, be more aggressive we're also going to be aggressive with our district departments and making sure that this is a joint effort and a collaborative effort and so that everybody is working towards the same goal because it's going to take all of us and everybody is ready for that. Well, I hope you guys come back sooner than later with an update. Thank you. Mr. Perlman. Um, I, before we wrap up, I had one kind of comment, and I, I agree completely. It, it's really disappointing to, and disheartening to see that we haven't made growth specifically in math areas like we've seen at some schools specifically and we've seen in other areas and even with looking at science the science assessment is really math and reading um, there is some science but math and reading is a huge component of science as well um, and really it's it is an OPS issue and we do need to address it it's a statewide issue too as a state Nebraska has an issue with math and I remember us being at an NASB meeting either in 20 might have been 2013 or 14 it was fairly early on when we got on the board and they were having conversations about math is a statewide issue we need to do something about math and there were state senators and people from industry and employment groups involved and nothing ever happened um, and it's something I see every day 
in my professional role too, where it's not just kids from OPS sitting in remedial math classes at Metro and UNO, it's kids from across the state. Um, so I, I really hope that you all can bring back um, that rigorous high stakes plan for how are we going to move forward and that that can become something that benefits not just us but that we can share with other districts to show because we know there's low achieving students in all districts. Okay, Ms. Williams. So I just want to share that um, there is something with those REACH schools. Um, if you have not been into a REACH school, I would strongly encourage you to do that and have conversations with those teachers and with those students and with the staff. Um, the unfortunate part is, is to do something as intensive as REACH, it does cost the resources. However, I would challenge you all as I will now be a unfiltered member of this community and be able to come and speak as freely as I wish now. I'm excited. Maybe you should be scared. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but maybe there's some, some ways that we can at least begin to model some of those REACH school practices at those schools that I know that those are, they're slowly coming and you, there's no way possible that they can all just be a REACH, you know, they can have all of those strategies and those supports. But maybe there's, you know, just a creative way. You have an amazing staff. Melissa, you've um, done amazing work here in the district. And so as you're really getting into your role, your new role, uh, maybe there's some areas of creativity that, that you and your, your staff can look at that could model some of those practices at the current REACH schools that would help us improve this. Um, we can sit and beat a dead horse all night and everyone can talk about their disappointment and, and we know that as a whole community we're, there's some disappointment, but we all take some ownership in this. Um, everybody has a part, the district has a part, families have a part, the community has a part right our mentoring organizations as a whole we all have a part but to sit and continually talk about the disappointment let's start talking solutions and so my solution offer to you is um, go back and have those conversations with your team and see what strategies that maybe there's an opportunity to use some professional development to cross chain from a reach school that's very successful working with two or three partner schools to to really talk about some of those strategies um, I think Yes, it's great to say go do it and come back, but to me, I, I want to be able to help offer a solution, and I know that your team and your staff can do that, but it's also going to take the work of everybody, not just at the board, but all of the staff, the teachers, everyone in that building to really say, okay, we really need to make a difference, and we can make a difference starting today, and that today starts tomorrow when the bell rings. Um, so I just offer that to you. Um, and you know you're stepping into something that was kind of there before you got into this role and so it is it does fall on your shoulders um, but I know that you're up to this task I know that you're going to motivate um, and inspire your staff to do whatever they can to make sure that our students are getting what they need and that's to be taught and 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 reinforced in these areas um, I want I want to be able to watch this next year and say wow look at the dramatic growth that this district has had um, but it is really going to take some open conversations and some hard conversations as well but um, I have every faith in you Mrs. Comine that you can do this but again think big I mean we've been a progressive district for the past five years so there's no reason that needs to stop yes there's a huge bump in the road but we have to pull up those boots and get over this hill and make sure that our students have what they need right to be successful thank you thank you you know, I have one more question that wasn't in my group of, sorry, when I was asking. I think one of the things that concerned me, and so I just want to make sure I understand, but at sixth grade, we dropped from 61 to 51 percent in math, according to page five of the detail report. And I guess um, having sat on the student assignment plan committee, we looked at all the data and all the research that supported that if you move sixth grade to a middle school, your test scores will go up. And you know, we spent a ton of time looking at that data and researching it, and, and I spent time telling parents that was what was gonna happen. Um, is it because we had challenges as we made that transition and we weren't prepared? Um, and I guess my biggest concern um, is, are we moving those sixth graders now to seventh grade with even less 
proficiency than those seventh graders came from sixth grade with and what it you know what does that do to us and and I guess that's a that's a concern I have I don't know if that if there's any answer for it and, and I think that speaks to one of the next steps that Melissa and I and others have talked about being necessary and that is a deep dive into data we only recently got our hands on and so it will be looking at did we maintain um, a similar number of students who transitioned to sixth grade? If we lost students, were they students who were advanced or proficient, or, or were they across the board? So looking at what happened exactly, at not just this grade, not just at single schools, but you know, constellations of schools, grades, et cetera, to see really what's happening. And we can speak to, to different you know, excellent examples within the district. We have 4,200 teachers out there. We can dig deeper than that. You, you know there's phenomenal things happening in schools to the benefit of students so working collaboratively as Melissa said we can help each to our own expertise to identify a path forward uh, be it curricular improvements instructional modification uh, or identification so it, it, how we move forward is together I appreciate that and I appreciate looking at the information on students who were leaving because I know last year I think and I can't remember exactly which year it was, but um, I know at one of my schools we lost over 30% of the fifth graders going out to sixth grade. So, um, so I think it is good to take a look and see what who are we losing and um, and really evaluate and really start thinking outside the box on everything because um, I, for one, that four-year-old who shouldn't have been in school, am thankful my parents and my elementary teacher didn't know the research because. That opportunity, even though it was a messy year, gave me confidence and the ability to be able to be successful in life. And that's what I want to see for our students. And that's what it breaks. That's where I break down and that's where my heart breaks. Because this data doesn't show that we're giving success to our students in the way we should be. So thank you. Okay. Seeing no one else on Nisa, I think we'll move to ACT. Excellent. All right, just to touch on some three key messages really um, as we move into the discussion around ACT. So the ACT in 1617 replaced the NISA for all but alt assessment in 11th grade. As I said, that's a very small number of students um, and it's based on their needs as a student and, and not being uh, the ACT not being the best test for them. Um, it is a much more rigorous assessment that is more relevant to students um, and does set high expectations to make sure that students are ready to meet this hurdle um, and certainly opens up more post-secondary opportunities. And I think one of the exciting opportunities is that, that it can open up the, that chance for students who may have not seen it as a possibility before. And so we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, so the transition to ACT as a state test does create uh, a communication challenge to a certain extent. It is very similar but different uh, from the national test. The national test really has just that benchmark score that we look at um, based on the ACT literature. You, know, you see that if a student hits the benchmark score, they're 75% likely to get a C, 50% likely to get a B. So that's the upper end. That's what the state set as advanced, but we'll talk about the proficiency levels in a moment. So the grade 11 students are this year's graduates were the first to take this opportunity. Um, I do want to read, uh, just send out a thanks to the Omaha Schools Foundation. They were a great partner in this. They provided healthy snacks to every 11th grader across the district um, that day. And that was a wonderful opportunity for them and they appreciated them. We actually heard that back, so it was wonderful. Um, we did have a release day for all those other grades, uh, 9th and 10th, with the expectation of 12th graders would use that time to do some career exploration or college visits. And so we did have a release day. Uh, we were able to work very closely with schools and district staff to create a, a great plan. Additionally, moving beyond just our buildings, we were able to provide training to folks at DCYC and other Rule 18, as we call them, facilities that assist uh, with the education of our students. So we're really, from a logistics standpoint, um, with school support and, and some great uh, leadership there as well, as from the district office, to get our hands around administering this test, uh, and a, a really a great opportunity for our students. Um, certainly there is a change to the proficiency levels, as I mentioned, that benchmark being only one of which. We see development on track and benchmark. We'll talk about those in a second. And uh, as with ELA, 2016-17 does provide um, kind of that ben uh, baseline score for us. Or so just looking at the, the various tests 
that are part of this assessment. We have the ACT English Language Arts. You may not be used to seeing that with ACT. It's the combination of three assessments, reading, English, and writing. Um, writing being a great opportunity for our students. It is uh, required by some premier uh, secondary academic institutions and not often something many um, folks taking the ACT get a chance to experience. So we do have ACT English Language Arts, um, kind of that developing area being a scale score of 1 to 17 with on track being 18 to 19 and then that benchmark being 20 or above. Uh, ACT Mathematics is math test. Um, it isn't a combination of any others. It's the ACT math as we've seen it before. Um, developing is the, the same level. Uh, we do see on track expanding to 21, so 18 to 21 being that on track measure, um, and the benchmark being 22 to 36. ACT science is uh, the familiar science test. It bumps the on track up one more to 22 beyond math. Um, one thing to mention, how this on track was set, so we know the benchmark is relevant to those four-year colleges. Uh, the on track was built in collaboration between the state and DE and our community colleges to get their entrance requirements as well as the data they had available to them about student scoring in these ranges we find to be successful in uh, our school. And so that's how the state developed that on track category. So talking about that opportunity for students to, to experience this test, what we're used to seeing with the national test is the results of graduates, oftentimes the result of a 12th grader who's uh, in, by and large completed his academic career in the district. We typically see 66% of graduates being able to take the ACT in that national testing opportunity. I say that in comparison to the 97% of juniors uh, that we were able to assess on the ACT. And so just looking at that difference, uh, one, we're assessing at 11th grade, giving them a year now to engage in additional coursework and preparatory activities to, to increase that score. Um, and so we are excited about that opportunity. Plus, uh, many of those students, as I said, some may got, have gotten a great surprise that, wow, you know, I'm right on the cusp of, of going off to college, and that wasn't something I may have thought of uh, for myself. And so seeing that is wonderful with our, our Benson Bunny's 99% uh, participation, uh, which is phenomenal in a school that does um, have a high ESL as well as special uh, needs population. It's good to see kind of a high participation rate. And as I said before, these students were also able to take writing, the writing assessment, which is a uh, unique opportunity. Many don't get to take that with the ACT. So looking at a scale score distribution, we see, and, and the scale score being what you're most often used to seeing, you know, the 36 or the 21 on the ACT. So looking across our schools, uh, we see a district total of 15 in ELA. Uh, in math, we see 16, and in science, we see 16. Um, for ELA, the, the low would be at Northwest, uh, 12. Looking at math, we see a low of 14 Northwest as well. And then uh, similarly, Northwestern Science, uh, the highs being uh, looking at ELA again, at 18 at Central. They also uh, were tied with Burke for the high for math, and similarly with Science, uh, Burke and Central receiving top marks with 18 uh, on average scale score points for students. So talking about some of our efforts to prepare juniors, <coughs> This year we have some excellent opportunities. We were able to get access to the ACT online prep. We also have a year under our belt with that tool, and so school staffs are much more ready to assist students in that opportunity. Um, what that provides is a, a shortened ACT assessment for students that then populates a learning path for them that across subject areas tells them the specific things they need to work on. It includes flashcards and things of that nature that students can print out and use for study or, or use in, a, in an online format. So there are a number of resources that is provided by the state at no charge, I, I should mention, and we have seen great success with students taking advantage of that. Um, one of the things that we are working with uh, ACT now is to get some exemplar papers. So of those writing papers, they span from one to four. And across the state, it was under it was a very it was under one percent of students who got a four and so one of the things we're asking for is show us what a four looks like show us what a one looks like and show us something in the middle so that we can share that with our colleagues in curriculum as well as those teachers who are focused on writing to make sure that as we've said before you really have to to, to own the standard you must understand the standard and a lot of that is to kind of see what that expectation is so we'll do that every year to begin to build a nice bank of, of what these writing tests look like and what student excellence on them looks like uh, to inform our efforts 
Um, additionally, as I mentioned earlier, we're doing a, a deep dive and, and we're starting this process and we'll continue. So we'll meet and, and have, res much as we did this morning with mathematics, uh, we'll, we'll kind of dive deep into what are we seeing here? What are we seeing as the, the reality this data shows and some opportunities that it provides to us individually? And, and additionally, something I certainly am very excited for is to hear what questions people have. You know, what influence does this take? Uh, course sequencing, for example, or, or other topics. W what difference does that make uh, in how student performs, which will then allow research staff to kind of dig into the data even more, see how course pacing and things of that nature infect outcomes, uh, to then provide that data back to the, the whole group as a whole, uh, be it our colleagues from curriculum or those focusing on leadership within buildings in the Office of um, the EDs or Office of School Support. And so that's kind of our, our next step in the very near future is to do that deep, deep dive into the data and see what we're seeing uh, at a much more granular level. Though it's not over for seniors, as we said, though they have these results um, in their hand and they have many of them a baseline now to build on, they do still have access to that ACT online prep tool. It's available to them for a year past when they, they gained access to it. Uh, given our late access to it last year, it was October, November time frame, if I remember correctly, uh, they should still have that access. And many of them could be up till Christmas even. And so they can still engage in that learning path and, and to make sure that they're continuing to, to hone their skills and prepare for that next ACT opportunity for them to increase their score. Um, I've read guidance uh, across a number of sources that suggests nowadays uh, to be competitive many students are having to engage in the ACT up to three four times and so being able to provide a, a baseline with transportation provided without having to pay for the assessment um, with breaks built in and support from school staff you don't have the, the some of the ID requirements and, and other logistical challenges that you do with a national test given that this is a state exam so there are some really wonderful opportunities especially for students um, once they get a hold of that data um, we've given guidance to engage in that career exploratory activities to get a, a better idea of how their skills can align to the world of work, to continue engaging in even more rigorous court work, coursework. As we know, excellence in core courses is what leads to excellence on the ACT and sustained expectations of high performance and rigor is what really builds that score. Um, we suggest to the students to build on your strengths and really, you know, look at your challenges, but certainly um, use that online test tool, uh, the online prep tool to, to really look at, in addition to your, your academic record, where you have some opportunities for growth and to really see that score increase the most uh, dramatically. Additionally, we would suggest to gain volunteer experiences um, to incorporate some experiential learning that can also come from work to really ground, as I said, the, the knowledge that they're getting in school to real world application. It's through the application of knowledge that we create wisdom. And so we continue to express that interest to our students uh, and to help build their resume as they move towards uh, collegiate opportunities. Uh, a full resume does help you there as well. So with that, was a discussion of the results and we'll open it up to questions on the ACT. Mr. Perlman. Thank you. Um, first question I have is uh, looking at page four of the presentation there. Um, is it possible to get the median score for the ACT? Because to me that seems very valuable. And if not, could you, I, what, what do you think about that? Average, mean, median. The mean, median, and the mode. Yeah, do, do we have a, an idea of what that is now? Or is it pretty similar? Or? I would assume, given a banded score of 1 to 36, certainly some skewing is possible. I can't say. I can definitely get those for you, though, in fairly short order. Appreciate that. My, my other question, I'm trying to get to the right page. It's on page 3 of, of the presentation. Mm -hmm. um, Do you know, uh, you know, this looks like it's something that was developed by the, by the state, is that right, for the three categories of developing on track and, and ACT benchmark, those were state things, is that right? Correct. The benchmark, so by and large the benchmark is ACTs, though my understanding is the reading one usually goes down to 18, the state moved that into uh, the on track piece instead of leaving it at the, the more advanced level. Well, my, my question is just, and maybe this isn't one that you could answer because uh, um, it's not something developed in, in OPS, but why on earth would a one be categorized as developing? Uh, the developing, you know, and 
I can tell you the reason why on our ELA test we have numbers is there was some debate among how to name these. So apparently naming conventions for test benchmarks is something of a deal. Uh, developing being the, the lowest bound. Um, you see beginning sometimes. Um, right. I, I'll just I'll make a comment then because because I, I think there's an entire loss of credibility when something is termed developing when they're scoring a one on an ACT and they group it together with a 17 which in my estimation isn't it's, it's, not, it's, it's not great but I mean it's a 17 for a junior that's a completely apples and oranges to a one I mean they could not be I mean they're worlds apart so I would just whoever came up with that I may want to re-examine that Agreed. It, that's a good point you know, and one thing I will highlight, uh, looking at our district average on the national scoring around 19 uh, for those graduates, putting them right on the cusp of that benchmark on average. So that's certainly something, uh, at least in the area of ELA, that we have to really lift that remainder of the student body up to. Mr. Snow. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, first question, when do the students receive their results? When did they receive them? Gosh, I'm trying to think exactly when they got their ACT results. It was, it, it was 